All right, guys, what's up? Welcome to Powerline Podcast. This week's episode is with RJ Powers and uh, Matt King Allen, two beautiful human beings. Uh, I've wanted to have these guys on the show for quite a while, finally made it happen. They are linemen and instructors, and this is just a really, really great episode. Uh, if you're in the industry and you're in the trade and you just want to like sit back and listen to stories and get some helpful tips and tricks, whatever. Um, also, if you're just getting into the industry and you really want to know what it's all about, this is it. I hope you guys love it. Peace. RJ, Matt, welcome to Powerline Podcast. Glad to be here. Yep, thank you. <laughs> you finally talked us into it. It's like, yeah. It's been a long time with you, actually. Not so much Matt. Matt was good to go right off the start, but yeah, you're like, oh, I don't know, I don't know. Yeah, well, two years later, you finally got me. Yeah, it's awesome. I'm glad you guys made the trip. Um, excited about the conversation. Been excited for it for a while. So yeah, welcome to the show. Welcome to the space, the new studio. Thanks, man. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, what do you Looks think? Looks good. Looks great. Yeah, very professional. Still in awe of it, where you came from, where you are. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I did. Um, I had one right before the studio was done. This was like the last, I think this was like one of the last episodes, Ryan Smith. And um, we had, I was just doing this out of my townhouse. And I just had like this nook in the side of the living room. Like, so it was like in the main living space where like my desk was. And I'd have to set up a green screen every time and the microphone and all this stuff, right? And we had some people coming to do some work on the house. So I couldn't do the podcast there and we got a dog and he's a hyper dog. He's an, he's an Aussie. Yeah. And I was like, shit, I can't stay in this space for this record. Like it's not going to work. The doorbell's going to ring. Riggs is going to go mental. And so I went up into my daughter's bedroom. She wasn't there at the time. She's with her mom. And so I set up the green screen and had her desk and I had like little stuffed animals everywhere. And I'm like, I took this like behind the scenes video for Brian and I showed him it's like room full of like unicorn stuffed animals oh, and yeah. Barbies and stuff. And I got a green screen in there ready to do a podcast episode. So like this space is so much better. Yeah, yeah for sure. <laughs> now you're on the sixth floor of Quanta corporate. Yeah. Use a Houston all around. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. God knows how much in camera equipment and lights you got in here. Yeah, it's a few bucks. <laughs> it's a few bucks, right? It looks great. It's pro. It's cool. real pro, man. Cool. Um, well, if you've listened to the episodes, which I'm sure you have, you better have. <laughs> Download every time, man. You know kind of how I like to start these things. I like to get to know you guys. And it's not often that I have two of you in here, so I'll do my best to manage the double conversation. But we like to start off with like a little bit about who you are and where you're from and that sort of thing. So, RJ, where are you from? Uh, I am from a small town in northwestern Washington, Granite Falls, Washington. Little logging community, um, real small. Grew up, born and raised there. Um, yeah. Which parents do? Uh, my dad. He had a custodial business. Fancy way of saying he was a janitor for a long time. Yeah. Did that, and then uh, he went back to school and became a private investigator. So no I was, shit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, he was. Magnum PI for the Northwest, right? What, like what led him into, he just was watching some CSI Miami. and Yeah, like, I he really liked, uh, yeah, he liked Magnum PI and thought it'd be cool. I, I don't know what made him do it, but uh, my mom was a paralegal, worked for an attorney for a long time. So they were kind of always involved in that law sort of thing. And he found a niche and he was really good at it and did it up till about a year or two ago. He finally retired. Dang. So, yeah, That's they cool. did that. and. I remember being a kid and helping him. Does he have any wild stories? Uh, from being a PI? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. There's there's a few. <laughs> there's definitely a few where he got in some skirmishes. And uh, I think the one that kind of finally ended it for him was he went to serve a subpoena on somebody. And it was kind of a bad area up in the sticks. And he went to go serve a subpoena to somebody and opened the gate, been to the house before, interviewed the people and stuff like that. So they kind of knew him. And he comes through the gate, a big old pit bull that he'd been friends with before, pet the dog, dog was great, came charging around the gate, attacked him, started going to town on him. He was rolling around in the yard, covered in dog stuff, and uh, got out of there. Uh, 
almost killed the dog in the process and all this other thing. And then he calls me up and my mom calls me up and he drove, he got into his car, drove down the way and called an ambulance and all that stuff. And I'm like, man, you're 60 years old now. You're too old to be doing this stuff. But did you give him a goat wrench from your line bag? <laughs> <laughs> no, but <laughs> I was packing a hammer. Oh, dude. <laughs> he, and he was, my dad's a real big guy. He's six, four, like three bills, big dude. And, uh, what happened so, to you? I, I don't know. My mom's 5'2", <laughs> right? <laughs> There's the mix, right? I got the same issue. Yeah, right? <laughs> I wish. But, uh, yeah, he, he was just always confident in himself and never carried a gun and stuff like that. He kind of took pride in that because mm. he did a lot of martial arts and stuff growing up as a kid. So he took pride in that. But, yeah, when you get to be in your 60s and start doing that sort of stuff, it's one of those things where... He's got grandkids now, and it's like line work, right? Right. Like, why take the risk, man? You're fine. Just get out. <laughs> so cool. we did that for a while. And yeah, my mom's always been a paralegal, so they've just recently retired and starting to enjoy life up there, living in the sound. So yeah. they're doing good. They still stay like stay in the same house, or did they? Like, yeah. Decide to move to a different area. That they... Nope. I grew up on uh, the Pilchuck River up there in Washington, and uh, they still have that house I grew up in. Uh, my grandparents built a house on a little island out there in the Puget Sound and so they kind of bought that from them so they bounced back and forth from a little island cabin to the house on the river and that's how they spend their winters and summers just bouncing around going crabbing doing whatever they want. Describe a bit about what it's like to grow up in Puget Sound area because like I find especially being from west coast of Canada even when you you probably experience this now too like being out in texas there's a lot of texans that really haven't even left texas is what I find. oh yeah like there's a lot of people that haven't left houston yeah and uh you try, try to tell them about like where are you from you're from like west coast canada what's that like and i, I often say like uh, you know what seattle's like the pacific northwest They're like oh yeah yeah well it's just kind of an extension of that yeah. it is so like what's it, what's it like it and you know we weren't it like i said it was a real small town where i came from there was a thousand people and probably i think a hundred in my graduating class if that so we were a real small town seattle was you know two hours south of us give or take so we tried not to go into the city and we spent most of our time out in the woods and stuff like that doing whatever and and that's kind of where you know, hunting and fishing kind of became something in my life later on in life than a lot of my friends and stuff like that. But it's some that that's one of the best things about the Northwest, if you ask me, is getting in the outdoors, exploring the woods, whether you go harvest an animal or not. It's just being out there and seeing the country and taking these cool pictures in the mountains where not a lot of people get to go. That's one of the huge things. It's one of the main things I miss now living in Texas is being able to just wander through public land because there's thousands and thousands of acres of it out there and zero of it here zero yeah. very, very very limited little. here yeah yeah there's a couple of spots but uh it's very limited everybody's private land here so that's one of the big things i miss about being up there and what was great about up there is you had that you had the ocean you had the puget sound fishing crabbing rivers everywhere i go fishing and like i said i grew up on a river so we go fishing during the summer every day mm. you know didn't have licenses or anything like that but if we were right there, we grew up on it, you know? So it was, it wasn't Seattle. Seattle was far enough away. The big city problems were away. Uh, I had family who lived there, so we'd visit and we'd see it. But yeah, we never had those issues out in small town up until recently, you know, that's when it seems like more of the big metros are pushing out, pushing out. And that's kind of what sort of made us rethink where we were living and wanted to settle back down and bring it back and move to small town, Texas. It's been the best move we've ever made. So, very cool, dude. Yeah. Matt, where are you from? Uh, originally, I grew up small town in Ontario, Canada, Lake Huron area, like Great Lakes area. Okay. It's a very rural town. Um, had a, had a good time there as a kid, but as soon as I turned eighteen, I was ready to get out of town. Um, <laughs> I have a similar experience. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's it's great there. Like, there's no knock against it, but it, it can get boring. It's it's a lot of the same stuff. I was always kind of the kid that was looking for what's around the next river bend or over the next hill kind of thing. So once I got some freedom, I was ready to go test it out. And then uh, I got into the trade and met my wife about the same time. And she's kind of wired the same way. So we lived all over Ontario, traveled around quite a bit. What did mom and dad do? Uh, dad did a bunch of stuff. Originally, we were chicken farmers until I was like maybe 11 or 12. And then uh, we sold the farm and we moved and uh, dad started building roads. Mom's been an accountant ever since I can remember. Yep. How did you just 
decided to like there, f- found somebody that he knew building roads and yeah stuff. there was a company down the road that was pretty big in ontario that did it so he got a job with them and started doing it um he got kind of burned out on that after a while because it's a lot of long hours in the summer i did it for a while too he got me a job there when i was a teenager it's a lot of long hours in the summer and then laid off for the winter it's very physical and everything so then he started driving a feed truck and they started managing that feed mill um took us now he's working at the dump the local dump and he loves it he's you know he's in his almost in his 60s mid 50s so it's just like a real chill job that he can go in and drive a bulldozer around or whatever whatever they need him to do um yeah so that's that's kind of my parents story my mom she was my parents had me when they were young so i was gonna say like they're only mid 50s yeah yeah they were young like fresh out of high school kind of thing so then mom kind of educated herself while raising two kids got her cga which is like a accounting license in canada and then got her like went through university online as well through uh, university of calgary and got all her qualifications started her own business with a partner and then now she runs her own business on her own that's yeah. awesome yeah she's very very successful at what she does how'd you find line work that's a kind of a good story actually first off when i was like 15 my best friend was an electrician and he's always telling me this is what i should do too because that's he knew that's what or he was an electrician sorry his dad was and that's what he wanted to do so he's like you should do the same thing as me and you're like eh. <laughs> yeah you'd always talk about crawling in crawl spaces and going under trailers for his dad and everything and i was like that doesn't sound awesome and then I was the kind of kid with dirt bikes and all that as an adrenaline kid. So he's like, you'd probably like line work. And I went to my guidance counselor and told her, and she's like, do you have any family that work for Hydro One? And I'm like, no. And she's like, forget about it. You won't get in. So I forgot about it for years. Great counselor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Super yeah. motivating. Yeah, she basically sent me to school. She's like, you should go to school for policing because it's easy to get into. And I had no idea what I wanted to do, but you're just supposed to go to college, right? So I did. Um, and I was in school, and almost right away I realized this isn't what I want to do with my life. But I want to finish it because at least I – started applying for jobs I can say I graduated college from something and my second year of college I was living with a guy whose brother was a was a lineman and he came over one night and he was showing us pictures on his phone of like they were doing implode he was on a 500 line as an apprentice and they're doing implodes and climbing these giant towers and there's helicopters flying around and all that and I'm like dude this looks awesome I was like is it good money and he's it's like September and he's like dude I've already made he tells me how much he's made he's made a bunch of money um as an apprentice so I'm like yeah this is what I want to do and he's like, here's some phone numbers. Just keep calling these guys and tell me you want a job. So I would blow these guys' phone numbers up <laughs> once a week, once See, every two weeks. See, for you, though. Like, that's what it... The one guy eventually told me, like, stop calling me. I don't know who you are. Just leave me alone. <laughs> so I kept calling the other guy, and eventually he's like, we're looking for groundmen. Do you know how to run a, a backhoe or anything? And that's what I was doing, doing the road construction. So then um, they got me to come down. They gave me a job as a groundman, and they told me, oh, maybe there'll be an apprentice, apprenticeship for you someday. So I'm looking around, and there's like 30 groundmen there, and every single one of them was like, yeah, I'm going to get an apprenticeship. And all of them had been hired before me, so I'm like, oh, this, is, this isn't very promising. So I started going into that same guy's office at, all the time, every week. How come I can't be an apprentice? What, why can't I be an apprentice? And he'd be like, well, do you got climbing gear? Well, no. He's like, how are you going to be an apprentice if you don't have climbing gear? Go out, find some journey with some old stuff, buy it from him, because I didn't know, even know if I'd get an apprenticeship, come in. Now what? He goes, we don't have tools. I'm like, all right, so go out, same thing, get a journeyman, take me down to the local utility supply company, buy all the tools, come in, now what? And they're like, you got your CDL? No, go get my CDL that weekend, come back in. They just kept doing things and doing things, eventually like, holy cow, this guy wants it. All right, it's yours to fail, man. Take it and see where you go with it. I always tell people, like, what are you going to do to separate yourself from the guy beside you? Because Mm -hmm. you guys have seen it now in training. I used to go talk to, uh, I used to go talk to pre-apprentices all the time back in Canada in BC. Yeah. I would go in cause I was kind of in like a resource management role for a while. So like the local pre-apprentice places would have me come in and do the talks. Like, what do you need to do? And I'd get this the same questions from every class that was in front of me, whether it was 20 or 30 of them to be like, what do I got to do to get in this industry? I'm like, well, what, what are you doing? They're like, well, I'm in this class. I'm in the pre-apprenticeship. I should just get in. I'm like, what are you going to do different than the 30 guys beside yeah. you? <laughs> yeah. And you're like, oh, well, I got a CDL. I'm like, do you have a CDL? Yeah. Do you have a CDL? Yeah. So what's, what's different? Like yeah. you got to keep keep being persistent, keep doing things. That di- I yeah. love that. Or, yeah. A lot of it's your attitude too, right? Yeah. Like when I'm looking at apprentices or pre-apprentices, you, you guys maybe grew up doing some plumbing with their dad, building fences, whatever. So they got all these skills, but nobody grew up doing power line with their dad or not many people, right? It's, it's super rare for that. So I don't expect anybody to show up that knows how to do 
to work in the trade or anything. But if you show up hungry and you show up with a good attitude, then that's that's what's going to take you far. So sometimes that's all the only thing you need to do to separate yourself from those other 30 guys in your class is just be hungrier than them and have a better attitude. And that might even take you where you need to go, right? What are you guys looking for in attitude? Like when you say attitude, what, what? just uh, just work ethic is huge. And that goes back to what you were saying is you can't teach a work ethic on anything. You can either show up hungry to work with a good work ethic or you don't. That's something we can't teach. That's something we can't yell at you about to get better you either want it or you don't kind of thing so we those are those are uh those are certain things i mean that you can't that can't be taught right mm -hmm. and then uh yeah i don't know but accountability too is a big one and that's that's for apprentices that's for journeymen that's for if you're a mentor or leader any of it you gotta have a level of accountability you're never going to be able to work on the things that you're lacking in if you're not able to be honest with yourself and be accountable mm -hmm. for, for those mistakes um, if I'm bringing a guy on the crew, he needs to be accountable for the things that he does. Uh, it, it just translates across the board, I think. Like whether good or bad. Both. Like, both, like yeah. be accountable for yep. it. Yeah. Yeah, well, it makes some, a mistake yeah. on it. So many people are like, they're quick to be accountable for the things that they can go, hey, look, that was me, that was me. And that's so annoying sometimes, <laughs> too. <laughs> yeah. So I know it's you. I've yeah. seen it, right? <laughs> Yeah, but so it's almost the opposite. It, like, it really does. Take that, eat it, put your head down like Bobby Orr style, and just like, just be humble. Yep. Be humble. Attaboys are not something in this trade that get given out often, mm. if at all, right? So don't be looking for it. Don't just be using that as your motivation to get an attaboy from somebody, because it's not going to happen. Typically not, unless you do something really above and beyond, right? But you just have to have that good ethic. Just like, I got to work, I got to work, and when those mistakes do happen... I almost find it's more honorable just to fess up and take the hit. Those guys, they always do fine. Yeah, you take your licks, whatever you did, you broke a piece of equipment, did something stupid, no big deal. And that's what we tell our students, especially at the ranch, is, hey, if you're going to mess something up, if you're not sure about something, I'd rather you do it here in a training environment where everything is controlled than do it in the field. So if you have a question about something, let's talk about it. If something's a little sketchy and you're not too sure, we'll get an instructor. We'll help you out. But for the most part, it's just the accountability of it. Like you may think, hey, it may be sketchy, but the rest of your crew out there is thinking, no, this is right. This is right. And then you do it and you're like, okay, that did work. That's right. Maybe I was just a little out of my comfort zone and that pushed you out of your comfort zone. And that's all it takes sometimes to get into a more comfortable spot where you you're better off running Digger Derrick trucks or cranes and stuff like that. You feel better about it. And our training environment that we have, that just embraces that. We can do that. I like that too because it's like it's a it's a place to practice accountability as well. Like a safe, controlled yeah. environment to practice being accountable for like fessing up to a mistake or owning your mistake or whatever you did. Mm -hmm. Right. It's it's one of the rare places in the world to where you break a piece of equipment and the mechanics a hundred yards away. And it's like, Hey man, it happens. On Some, speed dial. Yeah, yeah. Just tell me, don't bring the truck in and park it in the back of the lot and expect me not to find it. Cause I'm going to find it. And then it's a witch hunt. Right. And then everybody's mad. If you just come in and say, Hey, I smashed a mirror loading a pole. It's my bad. I messed up. That's no big deal, man. We could talk about that. We can learn from that mistake and share it with the group versus <coughs> just trying to shove it in the back nobody learns from the mistake and then the next guy a week later does the exact same thing because he didn't know yeah. right um how did you get into the trade uh i got into the trade so after high school did the same thing as matt uh, you know guidance counselors telling you go to college go to college go to college i uh did a little bit of college i made it about half a semester in when uh, i walked into like an english 101 class and Professor's like, pass in your thesis, right? And I look at the guy next to me and I go, what's a thesis? <laughs> and he's like, well, you didn't get it in the syllabus? And I go, what's, what's a the syllabus? Yeah. And he's like, it's worth 40% of your grade. And I was like, okay, and shuffled my papers and walked out, right? And that was a hard conversation to have with the parents. Like, I'm not cut out for this. My older sister, she was going to UW. She was brilliant, very smart, intelligent person. And I was just not that person. I couldn't focus in school, right? So I got out of that and uh, uh, my brother-in-law was working for Comcast or for a cable company, right? And so he got me on there for a brief time and I kind of seen, it dipped my toes into it, seeing the industry and all that and talking to some of those guys. They knew guys who were power line guys. 
So I kind of was feeling it out. And then one of my buddies who was a year behind me in high school, uh, he graduated, went to uh, Lyman College, got out and was working for a non-union construction out in the Midwest. And uh, he came back to town as I was still working for the cable company and kind of showed up with his new rig and all this stuff. And I was like, what are you doing? He's like, I'm building power lines. I went to this college and now I'm out working. I just was like, well, I got to do something. Got to get out of town. You know, I've been in the same small town my entire life. I need to get out. I need to explore. Hit this line school for three months. And two days after I graduated, I was working down in Vegas building substations. And just ever since then, just kept going and going and going, chasing it. What do you think it is about boys in, like, school? Like, I know there's obviously lots of boys that go to university and college and do very well. But, like, it seems like boys just, like, and... If you can't, like, I was the same way. I couldn't pay attention in school. School just wasn't for me. I just didn't like any part of it. I wasn't good at it. Did not get good grades. So, like, very subpar kind of grades. Yeah. But the second I found a trade, and it was just, like, night and day difference. It was something I was interested in. I was top apprentice and, like, excelled in marks and everything. Like, it just clicked. And it was something you could do good at. It's just something that you do as a kid if you're a boy, a guy, whatever, as a kid, what do your parents say? Get out of the house and go play, go yeah. play, whatever, get outside. So that's what you're used to. You know, it's different generationally, you know, video games came up and people are starting to transition more inside and universities are maybe a path for certain people now. But for me as a kid, they just, they always told me go outside and play, go outside and play. So now I associate going outside with having fun. Yeah. I want to work outside now. Because that's where the that's fun a is. fact, actually. That was like, that was my childhood as well. It was like ice hockey in the winter and dirt bikes in the summer. Right. And mom would kick us outside and we spent every waking hour outside. Don't come time. inside until the dark, until it's dark, right? You know what's cool too is like people were okay with, uh, not knowing where you were or not like being, <laughs> yeah. being out of yeah. touch with somebody was like, kind of, it was okay. Like, yeah, it was like, whatever. Cause we'd be on dirt bikes gone in the back public land just yep. like gone all day we come back fill up tank of fuel a yep. couple of chocolate chip cookies and a sandwich and we'd be gone again yeah yeah now if my kid goes to the front of the house i'm like where's my kid at yeah. <laughs> you know if i'm sitting yeah, in text the me when you get there yeah like <laughs> there's a location i seen some of our friends have these watches that you can put on your kids <laughs> so like when we go camping and stuff like that they'll give them these little watches and it's like a tracking device for them and it's like I look at that and I'm like, gosh, I can't believe we've come to this point. Yeah. But at the same time, we've come to this point yeah. where you, you got to know where your kid is all the time. It's a different day and age, man. Yeah. So I, I don't know, back to your question of why guys associate so well with this trade. It's just, it's one of those things where you're outside, you're with the boys, you're having a good time, you're making money and everybody's, there's good camaraderie there and you just have a good time. And some people trades not for everybody they go out there and they have a miserable time and they hate it yeah. that's fine there's other routes we need people everywhere right but for a lot of us it really resonates being outside and hanging out with your buddies and building power lines and providing a good living for your family that's great can't ask for anything better you guys are instructors now um and i want to talk about your journey to that point in a second but um as instructors from what you've seen me matt you can answer this first um what do you where where are the kids we'll call them kids or whatever the the people coming into the trade now you're seeing in these in the pre-apprenticeship what form of life are they coming from are they coming from like that sort of us like the outdoor where they like you know farm kids country kids whatever you want to call that or like where are they coming from now or is it a mix of kind of everything it, it's a pretty big mix Mo most of our guys are veterans so that's that's what they seem to have in common. But we got lots of guys that grew up in the city, you guys that grew up in the country. Like we got guys that come from Alaska that grew up in the bush. And we got guys that come from Kansas that spent their whole time in the city. But most most of them are military guys. So I'd like to think that they're pretty well wired the same. Most of them are outdoors, outdoorsy kind of guys and everything. I mean, just because you grew up in the city doesn't mean that you don't like sure. getting outdoors and playing in the dirt and all that kind of stuff. And they're vets, so they're most of them are into adrenaline and all that kind of stuff. They've, jumped out of helicopters and all this like they signed up to do that kind of thing um so i think that's probably what they mostly have in common and then we get a few op you guys as well and they all seem to be outdoors kind of guys like a lot of guys 
when I'm getting to know the students and find out about themselves, a lot of them are, they go camping, they go hunting, they go fishing. That's the kind of um, hobbies that they, they involve themselves in. So I think it's a pretty similar stories to us. It's just, we all chose to go this route right after high school and they went a different route after high school and then they find it kind of later in life. I get asked the question quite a bit, like what kind of traits make a good tradesman? Yeah. And those are always like what I try to tell people is like, you gotta, you know, typically good with your hands, like the outdoors, like working hard, physical labor jobs, you know, okay with like long hour days, um, okay with travel, like all these sorts of like traits. Um, would you agree with that? Or what's your thoughts? Yeah, yeah, I mean, 100%. minus the travel part of it, you just named a farm kid right there, right? Yeah. And that's like, I tell you what, when we're targeting people and stuff like that, like as looking for apprentices for your company or pre-apprentice, whatever, you target those kids because they can work hard. They're not scared of long hours and all that stuff. Those are the guys we want. So it's it's been something in our trade that we've always kind of targeted ranch kids and farm kids and stuff like that. That's great. Now we still have to keep bringing more and more people in because we need more linemen every day. So we can't just keep targeting these farm kids and stuff like that. The farmers are going to start to get pissed, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> You're taking away their labor. So many of them. Yeah. So um, we got to start figuring out a way to include those other kids, whether they're from inner city or whether they're, you know, country kids who like playing video games or do well in school. We still got to try and figure out a way to make it appeal to them. But it's just a hard sell sometimes when you're talking storms and long hours and being away from home. Some people just want that where I can just log into my computer in the morning and go to work, right? Well, it's not that. This Would you say that's the biggest hang up? Like what's the what's the biggest hang up when people find out what this trade is all about? Travel. Yeah, the travel for sure. There's a lot of people and it's understandable. There's a lot of people who don't want to spend that kind of time away from home. Um, guys that are in the trade too they get burned out on it as well, right? So then they start t talking to the younger guys, guys come to them and ask for advice and everything. And then they get a fair warning, like you're gonna spend a lot of time in some pretty crappy hotels. And after a while it gets old or getting on a plane a couple times a month or once a month or whatever, it can get old. Um, so yeah, I think I think that's the biggest deterrent that we find guys. Guys come through the program and they're staying on the ranch and it's six days a week, they're, they don't get to see their family and everything. And that's when some of the guys opt to take themselves out of the program because they're like, this is what I'm signing up for for the rest of my life is being gone all the time. And it's like, yeah, that's it's a big part of it. There's there's a lot of time off as well in the trade. You can if you're making that kind of money and you can manage your time and, and make up for it on the back end of the year or whatever. Spend extended periods of time at home, but your regular work week is going to be lots of lots of travel. Or if you're working close to home, a lot of time there's trouble. There's all sorts of stuff where you get home, you eat dinner, and all of a sudden your phone rings and off you go because somebody crashed into a pole or squirrel got a little curious or whatever happens. Yeah. And it's just, it's kind of like that squirrel. Yeah. Curious, we'll curious squirrel. There, yeah. <laughs> Poor Sammy. <laughs> it's just, it's one of those things where with our veterans, it's, it's easier for them to transition into that travel in life because in the military, they told you you're going here and there sure. wasn't an option with, with a lot of them. It's great. They can do it. And we just tell them, Hey man, it's three and a half years, four years, however long your JATC program is. It's, it's that long suck it up for that because you're set for the rest of your life after that man you've got that ticket in your back pocket if you want to slow down and you realize travel is not for you two and a half years into it don't quit continue on through thrive through that apprenticeship because then after you top out go work for a utility or go do whatever you want and you can be home every night you can do that but you have to get through this apprenticeship first man that's that's the number one goal we always tell our students right graduate the program here first and then after that get your journeyman ticket don't be chasing dollars yet. Everybody sees the dollars out west. Now everybody wants to go to California and everybody wants to go to the northwest because they're the most or, or need up in the northeast. And it's like, don't chase that, man. Chase your ticket. You need to get your ticket. And then you can pick wherever you want to go in this world. Yeah. So easy after that. And just get it. Become the best apprentice you can be in the process, and that will translate into the best lineman you can be. I talked yeah. about that with Dawn. Um, I've talked about it with a few people, but now it's a dial at that point. And like you, yeah. you get to choose to turn that dial as long as you're smart, as long as you're smart with your money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's a Lyman are typically not <laughs> <laughs> Matt being an exception. I, I'd say one of the biggest mistakes guys make is chase money. Like you're going to make good money no matter where you go doing this. 
I've never heard of linemen that are starving unless it's because they've made some bad decisions on their own. I, I would recommend guys chase the experience. There's so the line work is so multifaceted. There's so much you can do. And there's so much you can see in the trade. Yeah. Chase after those experiences. Go places you've never been before. I've been fortunate enough that through my experiences, I've got to go to places in northern Canada and out in the mountains and stuff that people would spend a fortune to get to go see. And I get paid to go there. I've seen like wolves and moose out in the like up north. I've seen the northern lights, all that kind of stuff. That's the kind of stuff you want to chase. Like made a bunch of money all over but that's not really what we what you remember what you remember is the different things you've done and the different places you've been the people you've met um you're going to make the money either way it's going to be there just like you guys just said just be smart with it when you have it and just just, say yes yeah yeah exactly Say yes man if they're dragging this job's over and they're pushing the job three states over and they say yeah we got work for you say yes man Mm. it sucks yeah you got to move you got to be there in two days and pack up your hotel but there's money there and there's work there go keep chasing that card man keep going after that Dex journey. and I were talking about this last night on the way back to the hotel how um people just what is it they want they just they 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 expect too much they don't do things with without expectation I guess mm-hmm. is what it is it's like the just say yes thing that's something I've always done as well and I've like it's all I've always been rewarded, but I said yes without an expectation back. Yeah. Like expect nothing. And I know that kind of goes against, you know, everything, work labor laws, like everything. Like, yeah, yeah, I'm gonna do stuff for free. Hey, sometimes it's not gonna work out. Sometimes you're gonna do something and it's gonna be for free mm-hmm. and it's gonna suck. Yeah. But like somewhere down the line, you get that back. You just yep. do. And Somebody saw that you did that and, you know, two years later, there's an opportunity to work with that person and they say yes because they saw that you would do whatever it took to do that job or or whatever, whatever the scenario is. But so many people do that and it's like their hands out right away. Well, pay me for pay me for my hour. Yeah. It's like, well, I can't pay you for your hour now, but like I really appreciate it. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to think you remember you for it. You know, some take, some people take advantage of that, but you know, it more than more times than none comes back to you in the end. It usually does. Yeah. I I remember we would uh, quit at three fifteen, and uh, we would get paid for that last fifteen minutes to three thirty because we had a five for fifteen rule. Come in five minutes early, we give you fifteen minutes on the end of the day. So three fifteen was quitting time, and I was a groundman, and I was those fifteen minutes I'm being paid for. And a lot of the other apprentices were like, hey, you need to know these trucks. You need to know this material. You spend that last 15 minutes instead of, you know, going home like everybody else does, spend it on the truck. And I'd go through the truck looking at material, organizing, just figuring stuff out. And one time a lineman came out and he seen me doing it. He's what are you doing? It's like, I'm going through the truck, boss. You know, just checking out material, seeing where stuff is. Get off that truck and get in your car and leave or I'm going to e-board you. And I was like, whoa, man. Like... (laughs) I'm just trying to better myself. So that lineman, you know, he had a different attitude about it. You know, you learn on this. But the other lineman who's seen me doing that, those were the guys who eventually started picking me up on their crews and stuff because I'd still do that. Like, I didn't even know what the e-board was at that time. It was just a grunt. I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. Take away my birthday. I don't know what you're going to (laughs) do. You threaten to fire me every day, man. It's just another thing. So it's just that little bit of dedication. And then all of a sudden guys start noticing and, here you are right yeah i understand because there is a lot of like people taking advantage of things like that Mm -hmm. and i that's why there's unions that's why there's like labor protection laws and all that kind of stuff but but there's a heavy butt in there it's like you choose your battles you choose what you want to you know and if you want to do this to better yourself better yourself i don't know like everybody in the world takes their work home with them regardless if they say they don't or whatever but if you're doing it to like make yourself better um, there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah, do to, it. To me, it was make my day go better, just like you said. Right? That's what That's, I mean. Like you're, you're doing that by making you better. Like so you know what they're not screaming at me to go get a side by, and I'm like, I don't know what a side by is, right? And it's like, oh, I got it now. I want to make my day go better tomorrow, so I'm going to study it a little more. I didn't know where this piece of material was today, and they yelled at me for 20 minutes about it. So it's like I'm not going to do that yeah. again. I'm going to organize better, right? But it's just that little bit of dedication. Yeah, that one guy, that was one example, right? No big deal. I did that multiple times after that. Stayed late, worked on the truck because I knew I had to. 
because if not, there would be hell to pay tomorrow if that truck was dirty and there was still material on that. They don't care if you got whistle bit. They got whistle bit too. That truck still needs to be clean and ready to go in the morning. Yeah. So, yeah, I didn't get paid the overtime, the 15 minutes of overtime. I didn't care. It just meant I didn't get an ass chewing first thing in the morning. That was just as good to me. Yeah. <laughs> Keep yeah. your money. <laughs> Sometimes you're just doing you're doing things so you can be successful, not because yeah. there's some sort of exchange going on. Here's what I'm paid to do, and so, so I'm going to do these roles. Sometimes you're just doing it for yourself because you just want to be better. You want to elevate yourself and be more professional. Yeah. Like I think it's important to carry that attitude with you. If if your whole life just becomes a system of checks and balances, company owes me this, or I'm trying to get away with this, it's you're not. It's not going to take you anywhere. It's not going to be productive for you. It's going to build you a bad reputation too with other guys around you when they know that that's all you're looking for. I kind of ask those people like, what are your actual goals? Like, what do you, what are you looking for? If you're if you're not trying to be better at the thing that you do for a living why are you doing that thing? Cause you're spending so much time trading time for money. Then like, what's like, what's it for? Just for the money, just for your money in your bank account, yeah. like for that's the truck a lot of guys or, the boat, or like, what is it for? What yeah. are you doing? Are you doing that much in your spare time? I don't know. Maybe you are. And that's what it is. Like maybe you love hunting and you waste, not waste, spend, spend. All, it's not a waste. all of your money. <laughs> on hunting that's great but like that's my challenge then like what are you doing this for then because a lot of those guys they'll they'll hold you at account and say hey we're we're going to report you if you're spending extra time on yourself they don't spend any extra time bettering themselves at this job that they do but then they go home and they don't do anything with their life anyway yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. it's just i think you nailed it too it's just a lot of money and there and there is there's a ton of money to be made in this trade and guys see it and they just get blinded by it and that's all they're after. It, it, everybody hits that point in their career sometimes where, where we are getting blinded by the money and we're chasing money because a big job or whatever, there's tons of overtime. I'm just going to work, 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 work. You hit a wall eventually, and then you got all this money and you're moneyed up, and then you're at home and you're just like, gosh, this is so much nicer not picking up the phone every single night and going back in and going back in. You can enjoy some time with your family. But, you know, some guys, they, they would – their work is their life and their work is their family. You know, sometimes their own personal life takes a backseat to work. And that's understandable at some points in your career. Some points in your career, you have to prioritize a little bit, but you always got to bring it back to your family. Like mm -hmm. more time at home is better. You know, and my wife's always said that. She's like, I'd rather have you here than be rich, right? Like I'd, I'd rather spend more time with you. And that's something that I've had, ha she's had to say to me multiple times like slow down i'd rather have you home uh -huh. it's like okay i'll turn it off yeah. it's that dial you're talking about turn it down you got to know when it's appropriate right like right. uh maybe you're about to get married maybe you're gonna buy a house whatever that's that's a good time to turn it on and, and really put the hours to it and make as much money as you can because right. you've got something goals yeah, yeah that but if you're just doing it just because you're just gonna burn yourself out there's so much sacrifice in this trade if you don't take some time for yourself and for your mental health and just relax your body like i'm sure all of us can attest to it, working way too much next thing you know you got injuries you got your herniating discs in your back and tearing tendons and all that kind of stuff it's a line work is a rough sport and if you're not taking the time to heal yourself in between and take care of your body you're it's just gonna catch yeah you. it's you're gonna be 45 and not be able to walk right anymore and hear it all the time we see it all the time right yeah, yeah you see feel it every guys. morning yeah, <laughs> yeah. that's facts yeah and it, I love the, I love these young guys that, because I, I was that young guy. What That was like, a long time ago. Yeah, it was a <laughs> while ago now. <laughs> Seriously, though. <laughs> and I was that young guy that was like, shut up, old man. Like, what do you mean? I'm going to climb how I climb. Like, fuck, I'll come down fast if I want to come down fast. And yeah. My knees. Like, yeah, cares um, about my knees. Yeah. And yeah it catches up with you jumping off the trucks was oh, like the yeah. biggest Jump ones like i'd always do it and I, I had this operator who would always just chew my ass up and down for jumping off the trucks and i was 20 years old i was 19 like yeah. i'll jump off a building man i could bounce <laughs> yeah. man never thought about it never thought about it and it was probably a year after i topped out still feeling bulletproof you know and i'm chainsawing a pole just pull, we wrecked out, laying on the ground. I'm just bucking it up into pieces, throw it in the back of the truck. Got my harness on, just got out of the bucket, and I'm just bucking it up. And the crane operator's right there, and he's kind of got a pick. 
I just bent over, cut a couple of rounds, and then I bent over on the third one, and everything locked up, and oh, I just yeah. fell straight on my back. And I'm like, get me to the truck, man. Yeah, <laughs> like, seriously, though. Drag me in the truck and lay me down in the back. I don't know what happened, but it caught me, right? Yeah. And it just, and that operator, it's like, I told you so. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it took a few years, but you were right. Just listen. Listen to them old timers. Everyone's got a story like that. Right? Yeah. We're doing pole change outs in the yard just the other day with the students and they're using the pole puller and every single guy <laughs> is carrying the thing. And I'm like, you know that boom, you know it lifts things, right? <laughs> like we could just swing it. We gotta get the boom over there anyway. We could just swing it over there and like, oh no, I'm good. And it's like, yeah. I don't know what I'm talking about, guys. Trust me, it's good to carry that with your back. Like pretty sure there was a nylon on it too. Yeah, yeah right? It's all sure? rigged up and but <laughs> That's, that's like a young man thing though, right? I'm, I'm strong as the moon. Gravity's got nothing on me. Like yep. I can pick this up. I can carry anything. And then next thing you know, you catch your toe on a curb while you're carrying the pole puller and <laughs> your RJ laying on the ground all locked up <laughs> yeah. like you're 75 years old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it hurts. I think they do it because for two reasons. One, because you're young and you're strong and you're kind of bulletproof at that point in life. And two is like, that's all you have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. you, you don't have brains even like you don't even have as men don't even have a fully developed brain until you're well in your 20s yep. oh yeah, yeah. still developing so, like, yeah. Yeah. you're not 20 buddy yeah i know i'm not 20 <laughs> thanks for reminding me oh yeah. um, so i think like that's that's all they have i was listening to this, to this podcast uh it's called behind the shield and it's a it's a podcast for firefighters first responders and military of the world and james gearing is the host was talking to this guy about um same sort of similar thing in firefighting. It's like, I got that. I'm strong. You know, I'm a firefighter. I'll just grab this, grab that. But he's like, it's not until you start to get fatigued. Does it, does it really matter? So he's like, you're, you're reaching down, you're reaching down on the side. You're picking up that generator with one hand, you're bent over side. Like it's fine to do that and throw in the back of the truck when it's the beginning of your shift and you're strong and you had a good sleep last night. Mm -hmm. But like, when you're 14 hours in, you can fight in a fire for 12 of those 14 hours and you go lean to the side, pick up that generator. Now all of a sudden you've <clears throat> blown out your back yep. right. or your knees or whatever. And so it's like installing good habits from the start. Just make, make it that thing. Let's not pick up the pull puller with our backs. Let's yeah. use the boom. And you just like make it a thing that you do every time. Just yep. do that. It becomes your practice. And that's how, that's how you should look at the whole trade because like kids <laughs> it freaking catches up with you oh yeah and i know you're sitting there listening to me right now like okay dad whatever yeah just wait just wait it'll yeah. happen and it happens quick man quick it'll when, happen in your late 20s back, <laughs> yeah when i think back to the best linemen that i've worked with over my career i can't remember any of them being huge massive dudes that were just muscling everything around some of them were really small guys and they were just way smarter than everything around them they knew how to use their rigging they knew how to use their positioning they knew where to put their body and they could they could make things happen without breaking a sweat when i think back to the guys who i watched struggle with stuff and sweat and putting maximum effort out all day every day it was usually because they weren't as skilled at their job as some of the other guys and they were just like making up for it with brute force and ignorance and well, there was a saying for a long time. I've heard a lot of guys say, you can be dumb and you can be lazy, but you can't be both, yeah, right? Yeah. So if you're going to be dumb, you better be dang strong yeah. and you better be working hard. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I see that in the field. I don't necessarily agree with it anymore. You got to be smart. Yep. You got to be smart. Stuff's too heavy no matter what you do, right? You yep. can always, I, I think you got to have that nice mix of both. But like you said, those, those best linemen I know were the best ones are rigging and did they get too blocked? Oh, yeah. Happened. But how fast did you get out of it? You've yeah. been in that bind before, right? Yeah. How fast do you get out of it? Those are the best guys. If a guy's saying he's never been too blocked before because he's the best there is, one, he's probably never worked that much, or two, he's lying to you. So either way, right? I can't tell you how many times I've been too blocked on a lot of stuff. But you <laughs> got to get out of it quick, right? And that's where those lessons are. And that's where the smart linemen come from. Yeah. Trial and error. Yeah, and taking, like, uh, it's built into us to try to remove steps, not for the sake of, like, trying to create shortcuts, but just trying to, like, limit the number of moves it takes to do something. And that's also what makes a great hand is just working on your system and your method and removing moves to get from point A to point B. And the, the good ones can do that really well. Like, they've just 
they've removed steps not to like not to remove safety from yeah, it or anything like that not to compromise but just to get their flow better get their workflow better and just like get production up while still maintaining being safe and efficient and all that yeah. mm -hmm. i had a journeyman that used to tell me you're you're a technician not a laborer like we have a we have a method that we do things we go out there we do it efficiently we do it to a structure with a plan uh, i think that's super important to to do out there it's it's how you avoid the injuries. It's how you avoid getting too blocked. Yeah. You're thinking 10 steps ahead of yourself. What did you guys spend your most time in, RJ? Would you? What do you mean? Like, uh, what field or genre of line work did you like or spend most time in? Um, so I, I started out non-union construction, uh, did substations for a, just a brief time down in Vegas, and then uh, went and worked a little distribution, then worked a bunch of transmission for them. And then after that, I got onto a non-union, or I'm sorry, a union utility out there in Oregon. And I spent time as a groundman there and then did my apprenticeship through them and all that stuff and tested out through Local 125. But at there, it was everything from we had an underground network core area, we called. So there was underground networks in the downtown Portland area and then everything to a 500 kV line on the east side of Oregon. And we kind of did everything in between we spent a lot of time i worked in the 17th street shop downtown portland um we spent a lot of time doing distribution with 115 kv over overbuild on it so you do transmission you know in the morning get the high line transferred and then work your way down the pole to the distribution i like distribution i spent a lot of time doing it uh where we're from up pretty much where we're all from right now up in the northwest it's all hot sticking so it's an art and i love doing that that was fun when I went back home uh, up into Washington, started working for utility up there, uh, it was the same thing. I was doing distribution, a lot of it, and I really enjoyed doing distribution. But I was also on a transmission maintenance crew where we did a ton of 115 transmission maintenance and stuff like that. I like both. I kind of go back and forth between them. I like doing transmission for a lot of stuff. And then you get sick of changing out three pole structures to a mono steel pole and stuff like that after six months of doing that nonstop. It's all the same rigging. So then I go, oh, I'll jump onto a distribution crew. They got a reconductor going there. Let's let's go help them out. That's fun stuff. So it was kind of nice working my uh, through my apprenticeship and everything in my career is I bounced around. I never specifically dedicated myself to transmission or dedicated myself to distribution or underground or whatever it was. I was able to just go, oh, there's an opportunity there, whether it's overtime or a job for a couple of months, I'll go over there because I'm bored with what I'm doing right now and just do it that way. Do you recommend that route? Absolutely. I think it's the best way to become a well-rounded journeyman. You know, these, these, I'm not trying to knock the guys who do it because there is a spot in this world for them, but like transmission techs and, you know, guys who specialize in certain things we do need those guys absolutely they're the specialists and they're happy doing it good for them but the bulk of the work that we do as journeymen is you have to be able to do a little bit of everything mm -hmm. and when those opportunities come up if you have experience doing underground or experience doing transmission work when a call comes you can say yeah i've done that it may not be a lot of experience but you have enough to get in the game and get your name out there and learn as we go and so i absolutely suggest Try not to be a specialist at first. Try and get a bit of everything. See what you like. Try and be a little bit good at it. You know, a jack of all trades, maybe not a master of none, but you can be a master of a couple of things. Sure. But um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I prefer guys who are well-rounded, who can just do a little bit of everything, a little this and a little that. Specialists are there. We need those guys. They're smart. Those are the guys who are running those jobs when you get out there, barehanding, stuff like that. Those guys who dedicate a good portion of their career to it. Yeah, those are the guys you lean on for sure on those big jobs and we need them. But for the bulk of journeymen in the US, I mean, we go on hurricanes, we go on storms, you're tramping around everywhere. You gotta do a little bit of everything just so you can be proficient and good at it and then build your reputation from it. That's the main thing. Also, I think that you, uh, the, the trade yet is like a lot different. You can do all these different aspects. Underground's definitely different than transmission, right? But right. then there's like certain aspects of it. And it's probably just like the, the common sense and physics part of it. That's like very similar. So doing all these different things really makes you that well-rounded mind. So be creative and figure things out quick and just 
be able to look at one thing that maybe you haven't done before, but understand how it works and how you can like get in and attack it and do it because you've done all these other things. You know what I mean? It's, yeah. it, it's, I had a journeyman one time after I went hot, turned hot into my apprenticeship and I was just having trouble wrapping my head around doing certain things. We had a line and buck pull to change out. And he goes, how would you do it if it was dead and grounded? I was like, easy to take a hoist there, a hoist there, and bing, bang, boom, right? He goes, now it's hot. You just change the rig, and instead of a chain hoist, you're using a hot hoist. And you got to isolate it from the pole. Is it that hard? And it's like, no, it's all rigging. It's all the same. You could translate that up to transmission. Yeah. How would you do it? Hoist and grips, man. That's how you move wire. It's all the same, whether you're doing it. Maybe do some calculations. <laughs> yeah, maybe do some weights and forces in there, right? Of course. Uh, but... It's all the same, more or yeah. less. If you can get the process down, you can do it all and just spend time doing it all because it is a little bit different wherever you go. But if you've got a general knowledge of it, you're going to do okay. And common sense gets you so far in this trade, man. You mm -hmm. don't need a lot. You don't need to be the most brilliant guy. You don't need to have a college education. If you have some common sense, some street smarts with it, you're going to go really far. Yeah. What, do you, uh, what did you spend most of your time doing? Or what did uh, you love most? Kind of the same story as... RJ I bounced around a lot when I first started in the trade I looked around at the guys around me that I respected the most and also that seemed to hold the most respect in the yard when they talked everybody listened mm -hmm. and I talked to them what, what did you guys do with your career where, where did you spend it and they'd be like I've done everything and I started to realize the best linemen out there are really versatile and they're really adaptable so not only do they spend a lot of time in every facet of the trade but they also spend a lot of time all over the country because the way they do things in Alaska compared to Florida, compared to Utah, it, it's all different, right? Different material, different tooling, different procedures, all that kind of stuff. Um, so that interests me. I'm also the kind of guy that I get bored really easy. If I feel understimulated, I need to, I need to find something else to do kind of thing. So I bounced around a lot. I did a lot of underground, uh, even did a little bit of lead and some networking, like what he was talking about, the network systems. Um, did quite a bit of distribution, rubber gloving and hot sticking and then transmission i haven't done as much as i would have liked to but i still got it on a few, few jobs around the country doing a little bit of transmission here and there and yeah it's been it's been a really good ride though a lot of great experiences and like you were talking about um there's there's times where maybe we do things a certain way in distribution and we do things another way in transmission but if you've done both aspects there might be times in that distribution environment where you can use some of the tricks that you a guy taught you on a transmission line and you can translate those skills over so it's just going to make you a better lineman to to see every part of it and uh, maybe you've got a way to set a pole and rj's got a way to set a pole and i've got a set, way to set a pole and if you travel around and work with all these different guys now you have three different ways to set a pole in your pocket and when you run into different situations, you're gonna be able to utilize them. Maybe the way that you wanna do it, we get there, there's trees in the way, there's cars parked in the way, we can't set up the way that facilitates your pole set. So now we can use RJ's or we can use mine. And yeah, I think it's important to see all those, see all the um, different aspects of line work while you're out there. How important is it to uh, be open-minded in the trade, um, especially when it, when it comes to like uh, crew dynamics? Yeah, it's, it's an asset. It's an absolute asset. Uh, you got to build trust with your crew, either as just a worker on the crew or when you're running the crew. Everybody needs to trust each other, and there needs to be a relationship between the guys. So if you're not open-minded, the, the only way that's going to work is if everyone who comes to that crew with you works the exact same way, way you do, thinks the same way you do, behaves the same way you do, and the chances are of running into a crew like that isn't good. And I've actually been on crews where it's like that, and it, it can also be really bad because now all of a sudden, Everybody's trying to fill the same role. Everybody's smashing heads. Everybody wants to be the guy in the bucket. Nobody wants to be the guy in the digger or the guy on the ground because they're all, they all think the same way or they all think they're top dog or whatever, and it can cause a lot of problems. You've got to be very open-minded, I think. I, I think that applies to more than just line work, too. You're, you're going to be more successful in life if you're just open-minded to other people he, hearing their side of things. And You see it every day in line work, though. Like, I know what you're talking about. Like, that, that guy that's like – this is the way we do a cut and kick or a kick and set, whatever you want to call it. This is the way we do it. This is the way it's done. It's, there's no other way. It was like, bro, there's a lot of other ways. There's a thousand ways to skin To that sneak cat. that pole yeah. in there yeah. or like to cut the pole at the bottom. Like here's a thousand ways to do it. No, this is the best way. I'm like, okay. Yeah. Because that's his way, right? Yeah. yeah. And you just, depending on what role you are at in that crew, it depends on how open-minded you have to be to it, right? If you're an apprentice, you, you have to be willing to go with that idea. If it's safe and it's going to be efficient, you, even if it's not the way you want to do it, who cares? You're the apprentice, right? Most likely you got to go with that. Now, when you're the journeyman and stuff like that, yes, you still have to be open-minded and hear those ideas, 
but your voice has has a little more say in it, right? But you still have to be open minded. You still have to be able to listen to other people's ideas and you know, some people don't come up with the best ideas and you still might have to say, Hey, that's great, but you know what? I'm I'm driving the bucket today. We're gonna do it this way. It's a little bit quicker, I think. And if they wanna fight you on it and fight you on it and fight you on it, then you go, All right, here we go. And we're gonna fight it your way then or something like that, right? I've I've done both. I've <laughs> I've been in situations where I've had to bend and I've been in situations where I've had to put your foot down on something, right? And it just, but the main thing is, is you have to be willing to listen to everyone on the crew, whether they are a groundman or an apprentice. Yeah, the groundman's opinion may not matter for nothing, but you're still going to have to listen to him or else he's just going to whine and cry the whole well, time. Well, that's a part, that's a part of leadership that I think is very important. It's what I, I always tried to do it. Maybe I wasn't at the best at it at every time, but... I liked to go up to everybody and be like, um, what's your opinion on this? Or what's your take on this? Or do you have anything to add? Like, make sure you include everybody, but then make sure that they know that my say is the final say, mm -hmm. but I want to, I want your input. Mm -hmm. Like I genuinely want your input and Hey, we might use it. And at times we do, we use part of RJ is part of Matt's like, and we make this thing work, but like I got final say. Yeah. And that's the best way to do it is talk to your crew, right? Those guys who who are forming out there who just like my way or the highway kind of thing, they don't keep a crew long, right? Yeah, the foremen who are more laid back and who look at the journeyman on his crew and if he's got competent guys out there, what do you guys want to do? Whatever you want to do. You know, the, the couple of times, you know, where I've been in charge of guys and they were competent guys and good dudes, it's like, however you guys want to do it, man. Mm -hmm. I trust you guys. You guys want to do it that way? Maybe I wouldn't do it that way. That's okay. Like, as long as it's safe and good, let's roll, man. I don't care. I'll build the tailboard however you want me to build it. But you have to kind of look at your crew makeup at that point, too. And sometimes you have to be that guy who's like, yeah, it is my way. Because maybe you're not the best at this. Maybe you don't have a lot of experience with this. It's going to be my way on this one. So there's a time and a place for it. But you still have to have your ears open and listening to everything because there's a lot of times where I've missed things, missed big things and just been sitting up there scratching my head what's going on. And sometimes it takes that outsider's perspective. My buddy who was sitting on the ground who wasn't doing anything who goes, hey, man, did you look at that? And I go, oh, yeah. I can't believe I missed that. Yeah. And it just makes you feel – it humbles you very quickly. Line work has a way of doing that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, just when you think you're the best guy there is in the yard – you blow up a transformer three times and can't figure out what's going on. Right? And Blind then you're, gods have a cruel sense of humor. Oh, they do, sure. right? And you're just like, is it complacency? Was it this? Was it that? Well, it could be a lot of factors. Ego might play into it and not being able to listen to everybody on your crew because you think you're the best guy there. Yep. And then one guy comes up and it humbles you very fast. So you just got to be humble, open-minded to those things, and you won't you won't stick your foot in your mouth nearly as much. Yeah. <laughs> what makes this good crew chemistry mm. uh, I think it comes from leadership is a big part of it um, if if as a as a crew leader you're holding everybody consistently accountable um, for, for their actions and e equally amongst the crews you're not going to create any divides or draw any lines inside of that crew um, if you're clear with your expectations and, and communicate it and everything, the crew should function well together. Guys don't have to be best friends to work well together. They don't have to agree on politics, all that kind of stuff. That can all stay at, stay at the yard when you walk in and put your boots on. Um, as long as as long as the leadership of the crew is effective and managing the guys and putting guys in roles that are appropriate for them, making sure you're getting the best out of each guy, I, th I think you can just create a good crew dynamic from that. Yeah, yeah. But I totally agree. Leadership is really the thing that kind of dictates how your day is going to What makes go. a good leader, in your opinion? Um, you know, we were kind of, it's funny, we were talking about this a little bit too, and we kind of both came up with the same conclusion. It's, it's the guy, it's the foreman out there who picks up the shovel first, right? It's the guy who runs over there and says, well, a hole needs to be dug. I don't care if I'm the top paid guy on the crew. Work needs to be done. I have to go do it. Groundmen see that happen and other linemen see that everybody jumps in, right? He's not above that job. You're never above that job. And it kind of, what another way into it is 
what makes a good journeyman, right? Well, a good journeyman knows every aspect of the job when he steps out of the truck. He's done every aspect of that job from groundman to flagger to apprentice to operator. He can do it all. And he's not scared to get in there and do that if it's if it needs to be done. Multiple times where it's been two journeymen up in a bucket, operator's supposed to be operating a crane or something like that, and he's gone or doing whatever or this and that. And it's like, jump in the crane, man. You got your cert? Get up there and do it. Uh, that pole needs to be backfilled. Well, the groundmen are going to move a truck this way. It's like, grab a shovel. You're not above anything here, right? You got to be able to lead by example with that. And those, to me, are the great journeymen, too, who can do every aspect of the job without question, step in there, jump in there. You don't have to pry. You don't have to force them to do it. They're willing to do it because they see a job needs to be done. And those are the great leaders, right? They can do everything, and they're not scared to do everything. Get in there. All it. Yeah. Le yeah. yeah, leading by example is a big part of it. And then just building a relationship with your team. A lot. Uh, I think that's super important. Uh, maybe maybe you don't respond well to being motivated until somebody gets on you and yells at you, Ryan, I need you to do this. Here's how it has to be. Maybe you're the opposite. Maybe as soon as someone starts yelling at you, you kind of shut down. You need somebody to just come and say, hey, man, here's what, here's what I expect you to do. Can you go do it? And then maybe that's how you react. So if you don't get to know your crew very well, you're not going to be able to get the best out of them it, um, in that, that aspect. The better you know your crew, the better you're going to know their strengths and their weaknesses so you can put them in the appropriate places. Uh, especially like if you're dealing with apprentices, if a guy's got a weakness, it might be something that he just needs to work on. Maybe he just hasn't had enough exposure to, to this or that. Maybe he comes from a different background where he hasn't had the same opportunity to, to work in that environment where he just needs to do it more to realize what's expected of him. Um, so yeah, I think, I think it's super important to get to know each guy on your crew, build a, a relationship with them. Uh, and then your, your expectations too, again, you have to lead by example with that. So if my expectation for you guys is if there's work to be done, we need to work and we need to get going. But then I go spend the whole time sitting in the truck on my phone while you guys are doing the work. Then it's, it's not really fair, right? You're not, I'm not gonna get the best out of you guys. You guys are gonna be over there cursing me out under your breath the whole time. Um, or any, any chance you get when I'm not looking, you're gonna take the opportunity to also be on your phone and, and not do what you're supposed to do. I love that. I love that part about getting to know your crew as well. Um, I always liked that part of leadership because I, I definitely wasn't the smartest person in the room all the time. And I liked to try to figure out what people were good at and then was good facilitating that, like putting them in the position that they were best, giving them the best opportunity to excel. Right. So it made them look good and it made you look good in the end, because if you could put a crew together, that could do all aspects and they each liked doing what they're doing. You didn't switch Bob and Joe because you personally wanted them, you know, this guy over here and this guy over there, but they didn't like what they were doing. Yeah. It just made everything miserable. Mm -hmm. And if, if you figure that part out, that's, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, let's switch to, uh, instructing. how did you guys get into and why did you get into instructing that? Uh, I was actually always, interested in teaching in some way. Uh, I helped coach hockey when I was younger. I taught kids to skate. Um, I did a bunch of volunteering with people like autism and cerebral palsy and stuff like that. So I just I found that building those relationships and, you know, t teaching a kid how to skate, how to move his legs or whatever, um, teaching one of the guys I volunteered with how to interact better in society and stuff. I always found that very satisfying um, and rewarding. And then as I got into the trade, I was going through school in Ontario, like trade school there. And I thought maybe this would be a cool avenue, teach the trade. And then I went to the school that's in Ontario and I was like, I don't think this is exactly what I want to be a, a part of. It wasn't, <laughs> it's not that it's a bad school or anything, but it's just, they're just two week blocks. You don't really get to know your students very well. They just come and go revolving door and just seem very like. You want to get a little more involved. Yeah, exactly. Um, so then I just kind of forgot about it and I got into the trade. Started doing my apprenticeship. And then even as I was a later step apprentice, I really liked helping early step apprentices with like the basics and everything stuff that I was comfortable in teaching and felt like I knew became a journeyman and very quickly became a foreman. So then I had more opportunities to have apprentices and teach them. And I really liked that. I would often ask for like, give me, give me a first step apprentice guy who doesn't know anything yet. I can show him a lot. Or I had a, I had like kind of a soft spot where I'd be like, Oh, this guy's really struggling and crews are having a hard time. Let me try with them. Let me, let me check them out. Let me see if I can do something with them. Maybe a lot of guys, you know, they hear, 
from a couple other guys, oh, this guy's no good. He's he's not a very good apprentice. So they make their mind up before they even receive him. And I'd be like, let, let me see him first and let me make my own decision. Uh, went out west and worked out west for a while. And then there was an opportunity to go down to Puerto Rico and work with Luma when they um, started the utility down there. So I went down there and there was a lot of teaching there because the guys down there had been uh, not very well trained in all aspects. And also they weren't supported very well before we got there. So they didn't have, even if they knew how they were supposed to do the work, they didn't have the tooling um, or the materials to do it. And so then after doing it for 10 years without the tooling, then you kind of forget what you're supposed to be doing. So there's a ton of opportunities to teach while I was down there, which I really enjoyed. I would get the a race, dry erase marker out in the bins and show them this is why using rope blocks is better than just reefing on it, guys. Look at the mechanical advantage or showing them this is why we EPZ because draw the circuitry for them and show them this is this is the difference between bracket grounding and EBNG. Like what's going to keep you safer? And it, it was really eye opening to them. But there was also guys from Quanta that were down there and they'd drop in on the crew and see that. And that was when one of the guys said, hey, seem like you like to teach there might be an opportunity for you down at the lazy queue do you want to try it out and i flew down i'd already been there for two different training courses before so i already knew it's like disneyland for linemen it was super cool and very professional environment and uh something about training the veterans too really appealed to me i just thought that was great i knew before i even met them i knew these guys would be great candidates for it um and then after as soon as my first class it was like yeah if, if we brought in 70 guys off the street there's no way we would graduate as many as we do because if guys don't meet the standard, we cut them, right? Yeah. Um, but it was like, these guys, they're, they're cut from the right cloth and everything. Um, yeah, that's that's kind of how I got into it. It was just stumbled my way through what I was doing and, and kind of yeah. found an opportunity. That's good, though. Like, you, you always like to teach, so finding an avenue and doing something that you already love to do and mm -hmm. be able to teach it. Yeah. yeah, it's turned out to be the most satisfying job I've had. I, yeah. I really enjoy it. It's pretty great. I loved uh, the pre-apprentices as well. Mm -hmm. um, linemen are great. Loved to try to teach linemen. <laughs> try to teach them. <laughs> <try to teach. laughs> they already know everything, so it's yeah. like, it's hard. No, we're good, <laughs> man. I don't got to listen to yeah. you. The pre-apprentices are so hungry always. Yeah. I love that. Like, I just, that's the way I was. That's the way I yeah. still am. So when I see that, I just want to reward that. I think it's really fun. I love seeing the aha moments for guys where, like, yeah, there's trying, so many of them too. Yeah, they're trying to understand <laughs> oh, yeah. something, like circuitry or something, like yeah. textbook stuff especially. They're trying to understand something and then you just explain it, give them an analogy or explain it and also you can see them, oh my God, dude, I totally, totally get what's going on here. Or you're trying to show them, here's how we're going to do the work and you're explaining it verbally to them and they're like, I don't know what you're talking about. So then it's like, all right, let's just, let's get our boots on and let's just do it. And you start setting the pole or whatever and they're like, oh, this totally makes sense now. I, I get it. And you know they're going to hold on to that all the way through their career now. Yeah. You, you just help them in some way. Yeah, super cool. You? Uh, so the guys who were teaching me during my apprenticeship and stuff like that, our instructors um, for night class and stuff like that, they were guys I respected a lot. And uh, they kept beating it into me and beating it into me. You have to give back. You have to give back. You have to teach. You have to instruct. Got to pass this knowledge on or it's going to be gone. And so after topping out and, you know, I started to, think about teaching you know night class and stuff like that well then i drug up from that place and went to a different place and uh same thing when i was there it was uh that was always playing in the back of my head like these guys i really respected as great journeymen and and great people um they kept telling me give back to the ibw it gives you so much you have to give back and get back and so i seen a void up at the place i was working at uh there was an opening for second year apprentice uh instructor up there and so same thing, night classes, work all day, normal days and stuff. But then at night, you spend a couple hours working for the guys and uh, doing class. So I helped out, was kind of the assistant the first year. And then the second year, me and uh, my brother-in-law, who was another lineman who uh, I worked with, me and him kind of jumped into the role of second-year instructors, and it was just it was fun. We had a great time. Second-year apprentice was like our favorite year. We both agreed. They were going hot in that year, so we were teaching right. energized workmen, transformer banks, and vectoring and stuff. It was all the fun stuff for us. And so I really found a passion, really liked it. And just like you said, pre-apprentices, and we were always doing apprentice climbing school and stuff when we're bringing on new apprentices or new pre-apprentices. If we had time at the end of the day, we'd go into our training yard and teach them how to climb or hang a service. Could be anything, right? And we always really liked it, and it was fun. And it was something we were fairly decent at. And so it just kind of kept going and kept going. And then uh, eventually when I 
I found the lazy Q and did this and kind of came down here and seen the program and seen how it was just different from any other line school there is just because of how it's ran and, and the fact that these are employees of ours and it's not a hundred percent graduation rate. I just thought that was the coolest thing with the veterans and, and all of it. And just the facility in itself is like you said, it's Disneyland for linemen. There's everything you could ever, no, there's nothing like the lazy Q. There's nothing, there's nothing at the lazy Q that you can't, simulate or there's nothing in the world that the lazy Q can't simulate right whether it's a network or whether it's energized bare hand methods and everything in between you could simulate it there and i just thought it was wild that this place even existed and then seeing the program and seeing how well organized it was i was i was kind of sold at that point and the fact it was in texas was just a bonus for me because yeah. i wanted to come to texas but it's it's just something cool i i really enjoy it i enjoy teaching i i enjoy getting that little bit, those, those calls from apprentices and stuff like that, you know, sometimes in the field, they're still working. If they have a question or some, I, I don't mind getting those calls. And I really like getting those calls where guys who've topped out, who've been apprentices who I've worked with, or maybe I've just taught them or something second year, or whatever it was getting those calls late at night, the FUs and stuff like that. I passed yeah. if you're wrong yeah. and it's like, good. Well, that was motivation for you anyways. Yeah, good. So good. I'm glad you made it kind of thing. That was kind of fun. And uh, just seeing it go through here and there's just, it's just going up. There's just more and more happening in this place. It keeps me engaged. Just like Matt said, I get bored sometimes with stuff and I start to get real complacent with things. It's just by nature. If you're doing the same thing over and over every day, you get bored with it. Well, our program's always changing. It's always adapting because our trade is always changing and always adapting. What was the minimum approach distance when I topped out was two foot one and now it's two foot two, right? It's just one of those things where we're constantly changing and being on the cutting edge of it, like we are at Quanta, we see all these new rules, whether they're rules or equipment or tools that we use, we see all the new stuff that comes and I just, I think it's so cool that I get to be a part of that. Yeah, so. when I was an apprentice, I got really lucky the even look at now that I've met a bunch of guys and worked with a bunch of guys looking back, I can't believe the concentrated amount of talent we had in the show that I was working in doing distribution. Just some of the best guys I've ever worked with, ever seen in the trade all together. Everybody, I was in my early 20s and most of the journeymen were like mid 30s. So the ages were close together. We could go out after work and have a good time and all this kind of stuff. Um, going through my apprenticeship every year, I was top of my class for grades and, and all that. And I got, I was realistic with myself. I was like, okay, I'm working hard at this and I'm putting the effort out and a lot of other guys are too. The difference is I've got these other guys around me that are supporting me. Um, the culture where I was at there, nobody abused their apprentices. Nobody screamed at you unless you deserved it. Yeah, it was very different from the stories I hear from other guys. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> it, it was it was just a really productive environment. And I, I looked at myself and I was like, I think a big part of the reason why I'm so successful and I'm where I'm at is because of these guys around me, not just it's not just all me, it's, it's these other guys. So I kind of would give them credit as through my apprenticeship as to why I was doing so good, I get my grades and I go thank them and all that kind of stuff. Um, and like my ticket could basically have 20 different names signed on it because they put so much into me. But then once I started having my apprentices, I was same mentality. I was like, you're only so good because me and this guy and this guy and this guy and this guy are making you that good. Um, but now I get to sign my name to you. And then with the program, I get to sign my name to a bunch of guys. And like RJ said, if, if we don't think a guy's meeting the standard and I don't want to put my name to him, he doesn't get through the program. That's it. As long as other instructors agree. Um, that's it. He doesn't get to, so now we get to put our names to a bunch of these guys, put them out there. Uh, and like I said, my apprentice, my apprenticeship was different work culture wise to a lot of, a lot of other guys apprenticeships. So I'm like with my guys, I'm telling them here, here's what you're hearing from other instructors, their experiences. It doesn't have to be that way. Cause here's what my experience is. So when you go out there, even if you are abused by your dream and get yelled at for things you don't deserve to be yelled at, don't do that to the next generation take what I'm showing you and how to interact with apprentices and, yeah. and take that with you and start changing the trade. And then with the trade as well, um, if I don't hand <laughs> all of my knowledge off to the next guy, some of that might just go away. If I don't teach the apprentice something and nobody else teaches them that, then that gets lost. Right. And if RJ doesn't hand everything over and if you don't hand everything over, the trade's going to go downhill rather than pro keep progressing. And I love the trade so much. I don't want to see it go downhill. I don't want it to revert backwards to where we were 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago for guys getting hurt and guys getting killed and stupid things going on out there. So it's, it's just an opportunity for us to hand over as much as we can back to the trade and, and try and elevate it for the future. I always hated the gatekeeping. It's yeah. like, 
dude, you weren't born with this knowledge. Mm-hmm. It's not like you, you learned it from somebody, you know, like it took a team teaching you these things, whether you realize that or not, you're not God's gift to line work. No. Um, you weren't born with it. Why gatekeep? Why not try to give that back to the next guy? It's a trade and there's a, an apprentice master relationship that needs to, it needs to work its way back. It is working its way back in. There's, there's a lot of good out there, but there's a lot more linemen that could be like, come here, come take you under my wing. Yeah. This is, this is what I know. I'm going to, you know, you need to put in the work back and reciprocate this, but I'm going to teach you. I'll teach yeah. you what I know. I I hear from guys that are journeymen like oh I don't like that that's not part of the trade that I like I'm not I'm not a teacher I don't I don't do that like I just I'm just here to work and it's like you don't have that choice this is my, my in our textbook where I did my apprenticeship the very last chapter of your last year book is your duties as a journeyman and most of that is progressing the trade being like uh, one of the forces on the trade that's going to keep things safe when other guys aren't aware of what's going on but what the main emphasis was you need to hand this knowledge on and you need to train, train the next generation. It's, it's super important. So I, I don't think there's really room in the trade for guys who they don't want to participate in that. It's, that's why it's called a trade, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, exactly. There's no other way to learn this than from the guys around you. You cannot go to college for four years and come out as a journeyman lineman. You can't take, uh, you know, at any of the line schools around the country, you're not coming out anywhere close to being journeyman lineman. It takes conversations to learn it all. And it takes hands-on experience to learn it all. And that's one of our, that's one of our problems or one of our issues is it takes a long time to make a journeyman lineman Mm. and it doesn't just happen overnight. No. (laughs) And it takes a lot of effort from a lot of people. It's not just something you can learn at university or college. Like you said, it's hands on skill labor, on the job training, on the job training. And it takes everybody's involvement to make that work. Yeah. 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 Also for the journeymen that are listening, like pay attention to what you're doing and the, the methods and procedures in which you're working, because whether you're directly taking somebody on your wing and teaching them, or whether you're just thinking you're doing your job, there's somebody watching you Mm -hmm. doing everything you're doing. I was that type of an apprentice. Like, I had guests that say, Hey, come here. You know, I'll teach you this, that, and spent the time with me. But then there was also just like me studying how they would move on a pole, how they would move in a bucket, what moves they were making to get from point A to point B. And if some of that was, I'll just reach up and grab this thing real quick. Nobody will see. Mm-hmm. Like there's somebody seeing that there's somebody watching you and they're going to copy. Oh, I saw, I saw Bob just move that. Uh, yeah. Like I'll just reach up between that phase and grab that next time I'm up there. Cause I saw that hundred percent, you know, we've seen, I, a guy I respected to this day, I still call him dad, uh, a foreman I work for. He, me and him, we were doing part of a reconductor and there was some quick and easy move we could do. Just throw a blanket over that transformer and, and real quick, just throw your gloves on and do it. And that's kind of was my attitude. Throw your gloves on real quick and do it. Well, we're a stick state, right? We're not really supposed to do that. And he's like, yeah, we got an apprentice on the crew. It's like, yeah, so me and you go up in the bucket, cover it up, be done with it. Nope, we have to do it right because he's watching us. And that for some reason that just resonated and sat with me the whole time. No matter what, he was one of the most efficient linemen I've ever seen. One of the best foremen I've ever worked for. He would get work done faster than anybody, safer than anybody. But if he had an apprentice on that crew, everything was so by the book, to the standard, to the spec. It was just incredible. You you were forced to do that. And you were forced to do all these hard, what you thought were maybe extra moves, Mm -hmm. but it was the right way to do it. Even though you know that shortcut is there and it exists and you're a journeyman and I know I can get away with it. It's exactly what you said. That apprentice is just watching you like a hawk. Mm -hmm and doesn't know the whole backstory of it, of why you can get away with touching this and not touching that because you're whatever in a bucket. He doesn't know that. He just knows that you just threw that blanket on there with no gloves on and just, you're good. He's gonna do that, he doesn't know the context. So you have to do it so by the book. And that kinda has stuck with me so much. Anytime I have an apprentice, I think, well, if it's me, I can do this, this, and that, and eh, kind of slide a corner there, and then just kind of thinking like, 
that apprentice is going to be right there in that bucket with me or right there standing at the neutral watching every single move I do. And if I cut that corner, he's going to cut that corner and he's not even going to know he's cutting that corner. You have to do it right or else you're training wrong. And that just kind of sat with me for the rest. And that was fresh after I topped out. And so I just kind of carried that the whole way as best I can. Don't get me wrong. People get lazy and we start doing things that maybe we shouldn't be doing. But for the most part, for almost now in my career, I could say that that's how I work. If I got an apprentice on the crew, it is completely by the book. And it is for the rest of my job too. Nowadays, mm -hmm. I'm not cutting those corners and stuff like that, but it's just one of those things we have to think of who we're training and how we're training them. Because if you're training them the same way you came up and you're cutting those corners, just like those guys before, maybe you did understand it, but this guy's not going to understand it. So we have to train right. Even if you don't have the apprentice or pre-apprentice on your crew, you can use that as an opportunity to challenge yourself to like elevate sure. your right. yep. skill level too. I remember through my apprenticeship, every six months we'd have uh, apprentice reviews. So I'm in my, my last year of my apprenticeship and I go for my review with my foreman and he just goes, yeah, you're doing good, man. Congrats. Like, just keep it up and you'll be a journeyman in no time. And I'm like, I top out in less than a year and I'm not doing the same quality of work, the same speed as these other guys. Like, I need more feedback than that. Let me know what I can do better. And at the time we were working on a system, it was 16,000 phases of ground, uh, 27, six phase of phase. So when we get on single phase lines, guys all the time, your twos are rated to 17. They would wear their twos because there's no other phase in the air. But the rules say you're supposed to use the phase of phase voltage. So we should have been wearing our fours the whole time, right? And I would do the same thing. So that's what I watched all my journeymen do, throw the twos on to go work on the 16. And he's like, all right, who's, he's like, out of all the guys in our show up, who's, who would you say is the most talented lineman in there? And I was like, probably Pat Crump. He's, he's pretty deadly. He's pretty good. And he goes, yeah, you ever watch what gloves he wears on the 16? And I'm like, no. And he goes, take a look. So then he happens to be working. We look, he's got his fours on. And he goes, so Pat's faster than everybody. He makes it look better than everybody. He just all around does a better job than most of the guys here. And he does in his fours. You know, what does that say? And it's like, it just says he's that much better than the rest of the guys. His craft, he's elevated himself that much further. You don't even realize he's wearing his fours because he's working just the same as the guys in their twos and everything. And that stuck with me. It was like, I would, I would much rather be like him and do it to a T and just as fast and just as talented as the other guys. I mean, there's nothing wrong with a lot of the guys I was working with that he was a step above, but it's just like, that's who I want to be. That's, that's what I look up to. Yeah. Yeah. And with the pre-apprentices and apprentices, they're also like having a two-year-old with you. You drop an F-bomb in front of your kid, <laughs> and suddenly that's all they're saying, right? <laughs> so true. These yeah. guys, some of them don't know anything. So if you go, yeah, the skinny part of the pole is the one that goes in the ground, they'll go, okay, <laughs> and they'll set it upside down. Um, just the other day, we were doing a demonstration in our lab, and we have transformers that are at like ground level. And they're not energized or anything, but there's a cut out on them. So I'm just like, oh, yeah, obviously you open your cut out and I just baseball bat it because I'm standing two feet away from it. Next thing you know, we take them out in the yard and guys are up there smashing cut outs <laughs> open. And I'm like, oh, my God, no, you can't, you can't do that. Like, they're like, well, you did it. And I'm like, we we're standing in a lab in a building. But I realized you got to show them yeah. exactly how it's supposed to be because that's the first time they ever or second time they've seen somebody open a cut out. And they're like, dude, that looks sick. I want to do that. And it's like, no, you can't. These are porcelain cut outs. They're going to shatter. They're sponges. They're sponges when you don't want them to be in the yeah. rocks when they yeah. want them to be sponges. It's like I've explained man. the same thing 10 times. That's... You didn't get it. And you watch that one thing. That's what stuck. Like, come on. Yeah, man. You see me. I did something similar with a load bust. Same thing in the lab showing it. And I was just showing it for opening purposes. Put the load bust on there, open it. And then I just closed it back in using the load bust. Yeah. Like, just so I could whatever. Right. And then. An hour later, I go out in the yard, and they're all closing back in with the load bus. And I'm like, <laughs> what are you guys doing? Yeah. You did that. And I was like, I did it just to close it in real quick yeah. and put the demonstration back. And they're like, no, that's how you use it. I was like, no, it's not. Guys, guys. Yeah, make sure you do that when you get out of the field. Don't yeah. do that, oh, man. God. Come on. <laughs> but they stick to just the littlest the littlest detail that you miss that you're like, oh, it's so obvious. You know, don't baseball bat it. Grab yeah. it in the eye, right? Yeah. Nope. They grabbed onto that and it's everything to them and you just amplify that by having a hot apprentice in that situation and yeah. he sees you do some little shortcut and then all of a sudden that's gospel yeah and it's like no man we were we were cutting a fat hog there yeah. we were trying to skate through and it's, nope that's gospel that's everything that's yeah. how you do that that's what I remember yeah. oh man or worse they go out and they say yeah this is how rj does oh it. man and it's like no no <laughs> The bus comes multiple times a day, and I'm like, I didn't even say that. Where did they get that from? And they confuse me with somebody else or me with you. And yeah. it's, we've sat in the mule multiple times where they're like, RJ and Matt told us not to do this. And we look at each other like, 
You didn't even talk to that <laughs> yeah, student. What are you, what are you talking, talking about? Yeah. Oh, they play the game. Oh, they, they know it, it, right? Oh, yeah. Look what. How do you do this? Oh, I don't like that answer. Go to another answer. How do you do that? I like that answer. Don't like that that yeah. <laughs> oh, dude, and, and that's just it. So we figured out their game. You know, you figure it out multiple. When you get into their couple classes, like, they come up and they start probing for those answers. Well, how would you do this? And it's like, who have you talked to? <laughs> yeah. And they're like, oh, I talked to, you know, Don or something. And you're like, what Don tell you? You said do it this way, then do it that way. Yeah. <laughs> that way is fine. Yeah. Quit trying to pit us against each other. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I support Omar's decision. Yes. Just go do this. Go do that. Yeah. I don't support it, but just do it because yeah. he told you to do it. <laughs> if I was an aspiring apprentice or pre-apprentice um, that hadn't been in that position yet with your guys' experience, what would you tell that person? Like, What do they need to know? What questions, I guess – what questions are uh, are these pre apprentices asking the most, or what are they doing the most that you could tell the aspiring apprentice or pre app? They're they're really curious on the travel part of it, and we try and emphasize that so much to these guys. Is you know you're getting into a contracting apprenticeship, you're going to travel, and they they always I swear you get asked it once a week like. If I go here, do you think I'll travel a bunch? And guys have been asking me that who want to go to the Northwest. You know, if I go work for this contractor out there, it's, am I going to be steady there? And the answer is, I don't know, man. It depends. Travel is, it is what it is. Sometimes it's feast, sometimes it's famine. Sometimes you can spend your entire apprenticeship and buy a house where you want to and finish your apprenticeship there. And there's some guys who are living in a fifth wheel for three and a half years going across every single state and sell cats area. You know, it's just hard to say. The travel part of it, it circles back to the conversation we had earlier. Just be open to it and willing to say yes. Yeah, you're going to miss stuff. Your wife's birthday, kid's birthday, stuff like that. It sucks. I get it. But for three and a half, four years, you can suck it up. And you can get through it. You can get your ticket. And then after that, when it's your kid's birthday and you're on the road, you've got a little more skin in the game. I'm a journeyman. No, I'm going home for my kid's birthday. We can, we can start... We can start choosing our work at that point, right? But for now, just be willing to say yes and travel. Travel's the biggest question we get from guys. How much travel? How much travel? I don't know. The L-O-T-S. industry doesn't even know. <laughs> Dude, nobody knows. Yeah. You're you're a product of the JATC that you're going to or whatever apprenticeship you're going to, and they're going to ship you where the work is. So just be willing to say yes and take that experience on. Yeah, stuff I get asked often. First one is always, how much money am I going to make here? How much yeah. money... And my advice for that is don't worry about it. If, if the whole reason you're doing this is just for a dollar, you're not going to last. You're going to get burned out. It's not going to be worth it all the way through. Uh, so don't worry about that part of things. Just know that you're going to be able to feed your family and your wife probably won't even have to work if she doesn't want to. Uh, and then guys start asking questions like, am I going to have to travel? Um, if I go work in this local, do you think I'll have to do much underground? Do you think I'll have to do much of this, much of that? And my advice for that is, you're pre-apprentice. You don't know what any of that's like. Don't come in with a preconceived notion that I don't like underground when you've never done it. Don't have a preconceived notion that I don't want to travel when you've never done it. Maybe you'll start traveling and realizing I'm a young man traveling the country, making money, and this is really cool. I'm meeting all sorts of different people and seeing all sorts of different stuff. Maybe you've lived in Texas all your life and then you get to go work in Utah and you didn't realize how much you'd actually like living somewhere outside of Texas or wherever you're from, right? Like maybe you'll move to a different part of the country and realize this, this is where I actually want to be. This, this fits me a lot better. So just don't go on with a preconceived notion. It goes back to what we were talking about a little while ago. Just say yes to a bunch of different things. Say yes to a bunch of different opportunities, try them out and see what fits right. See what you like. Maybe somebody, maybe some journeyman live and have told you, oh, underground's the worst and the only guys who go there can't hack it over here and blah, 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 blah. Chances are they're saying that because that's a big hole in their trade and it's yeah. a lot easier to admit uh, or it's a lot easier to say, oh, that's barely line work than it is to say, I have no idea how to do that and I would be lost over there. Yeah. Maybe you get on an underground crew and all of a sudden you realize this is great. I'm having a lot of fun. Like I've done a lot of underground and I had a ton of fun doing it. And it's probably the most money I've made was on underground jobs. There's lots of night night shifts and weekends and all that. But if you go in with the preconceived notion that you already don't like underground, you're not going to enjoy it when you get there because you've already made up your mind and you're going to miss out on all those opportunities. That's the rad thing. Uh, one of the rad things about the job is like, if you want to go, um, like say it's just you and your wife or whatever, and you want to go experience other cities and just like live in other cities for a while. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I want to go experience this state for a while. There's a job there. Chances are there's a job there for you. Right. And there's not a lot of other industries that offer something like that. Yeah. And it's such a quick transition. Like you could almost, almost be working tomorrow 
in any other state. Yep. Like you oh, could yeah. leave Texas, go to California, be working like tomorrow yep. or whatever. That, that was how That's I ended cool. up on the West Coast. Like me yeah. and my wife were just tired of the same kind of thing in Ontario. We wanted to go on an adventure. We like to travel and try something different. And I yeah. called a buddy of mine and was like, anywhere in North America, where would you say go work? Who would you say to go work for? And he was like, you should go work for Alltech and BC. So when did it? And then we moved to British Columbia and it was like, this is my favorite place in the country. One of my favorite places in the world. Yeah. <laughs> you get to get out in the mountains all the time and climb and ski and all this awesome stuff. And it's like my, my trade facilitated that and just being open to trying different things was what allowed me to get there. And that's what allowed me to build a resume that made them interested when I handed it in. It was because I've well-versed and got a bunch of different experiences. So when I applied for the job, it was like, hey, yeah, you'd probably fit in here and come on it. This trade is notoriously hard on families, hard on families and hard on like individual mental health. Um, what advice do you got? That's a, that's a tough one because everybody's <coughs> situation is different. Sure. You know, um, what I, I was very blessed with my wife and, and her being the rock that she is and being able to raise kids with me being gone four or five nights a week and, you know, when I was commuting back and forth to Texas and living in Washington, I was gone for weeks at a time. And she's she's a really strong individual for that. But at the same time, she'll hit her breaking point, too, where she's like, you need to do this. You need to be home. I need you there. You got to be willing to adjust a little bit to that. But I told her <laughs> I told her a long, long time ago, I was uh, I had a journeyman tell me this. And he's like, yeah, if your old lady's getting on you about the apprenticeship and this and that and working too much, just tell her this. The next three years are all about me. The next 30 years are about you. And I thought, yeah, that's a good thing to mm -hmm. throw out there. I'll, I'll throw that out there one time when she's mad at me. And I said <laughs> it in passing, like didn't think much of it. No, she's holding you to it. Oh, about five years later, yeah, she uh, she goes, I, I want a new car. Yeah, you're and two I was years like, past your three. <laughs> oh, and I was like, yeah, I want a new car, man. And I go, yeah, what's wrong with your old car? I don't like it. Yeah, I want a new boat too. What, what's the big deal? Like, we all want things. She sure goes, you remember? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you remember when you said that to me? And I was like, oh, man, she's pulling stuff from way yeah. back. And I was like, well, let's go get you a new car, right? You got to be, you got to be willing to listen to your spouse or or whoever there, right? Because you know they're just as much vested in it as you are. If they're telling you this is this is the breaking point or something like that, you know, you really got to talk, have that hard talk. Um, but there's times, especially after you just, if you can grind it out through that apprenticeship, it's a grind, I know. But if you can make it through that, your life will be, you just got to reiterate to your spouse, whoever that is, that life is going to be so much better after we get this ticket. I'll be able to go where we want. Do you want to go to Hawaii? You want to go live there? I mean, I had an opportunity after I topped out to go work in Maui because we vacationed in Maui all the time. And I was like, you want to go live there? We can go, we'll go wherever you want. I don't care. I'm willing to travel. And so Texas, Texas, Texas. and she chose <laughs> Texas <laughs> and that's where we are. Right. Yeah. And so it's one of those things where I was never worried about it. Um, like I said, everybody needs electricity. I'm not worried about it. If there's power lines to be built, I'll go build them. I don't care if it's in Texas. I don't care if it's in Washington or Hawaii. I don't care. Um, but whatever she wanted, I was, yeah, I'll do it. I don't care. She helped me through that apprenticeship. She made it possible for me to get through that apprenticeship. I'm going to take care of her as best as I can. And it's, it's tough because later on in my journey, when I was a journeyman and stuff, and I was working a bunch trying to hit these goals of buy this or don't buy that, whatever it was, she'd tell me, like, that's enough. And I'd stop. And I'd, okay, that's enough overtime. All right, I'm going to quit for a bit. And then, oh, this broke or that broke or whatever. And it's like, all right, time to turn it back on. You know, you just got to be willing to listen to them and have that good conversation with them about everything. If you're just hitting the pub every night and not talking to your spouse and just coming home drunk and passing out, that's not a good life to live. It's not going to last long. For longevity in this trade, it's not going to work. Uh, you got to be willing to have a good home life so you can have a good work life. If your home life is struggling, you're going to be struggling at work. You have to have both straight to be successful. And I'm very blessed that I think I have that. Yeah. I mean, if you just come home and you're so annoying to live with, she'll pack your bags. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, communication, communication is key for sure. Uh, you got to make time. You're, you're going to be working lots and you're going to be tired when you get home. 
at night and everything. But if you're not going home to your own bed every night, you still got to make sure you make that time to communicate. FaceTime is always better than a phone call and a phone call is always better than a text message. Just hearing each other's voices, seeing each other's faces, even if it's for five minutes, it can make all the difference in your relationship um, while you're gone. I don't have kids, so I speak from a little bit of a different avenue than everybody else. It's just me and my wife and our dog. Um, but just making sure that I make time for her is super important and communicating. And anytime I start slacking on my end of things, you know, we get busy at the school and we're at, I'm in a different time zone and everything. It can get difficult to communicate. And once I start missing on that, I start noticing that it affects our relationship. So just, just make sure you make the time. If that your relationship should be your priority, otherwise you're with the wrong person. And then if you don't make them feel like they're the priority, then you're making a mistake and that's on you. You gotta, you gotta make up for that. And then when I'm home, I think it's important to, you know, Everybody communicates and, you know, feels loved in different ways. So the way that maybe is natural to me to like express how I feel for her is maybe not the way that emphasizes the most to her. Right. So I make sure that before I leave back down in Texas here that I do the things that are going to make her feel like I appreciate her and care about her time and, re you know, respect the home and everything, all that kind of stuff. Uh, for example, like a lot of guys, they think I'm making lots of money. So I'll just buy my wife a bunch of gifts and then everything should be good because she's getting lots of gifts. Well, for a lot of women, that doesn't, that doesn't translate into you love me. That just means you're buying me a bunch of stuff, right? So you gotta, you gotta figure out what the right way to make her feel loved is and appreciated. And then that's what you do when you're at home. Can we add a whipping sound effect right here? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, that's all, God, that's all God. like <laughs> excellent stuff. And one of the things I found, there's so much, there's so much to manage and, um, there's so much to manage there. There's also like your own individual mental health. And this is one of the things with line work. Like we just spent an hour and a half talking about traveling a lot in line work. So like you're going out, you're traveling, you're doing this job and yes, you love this job, but it's still work. It's still a job and it's still like, yeah, it's great, but it's not my full identity. And then you get a week or so to go home and you have responsibilities there with your significant other and your, say your kids, your dog, like everyone wants a piece of you. And I think if you spread that over time, that's where a lot of guys break down, men and women, I'm sure, but just more of experience with men breaking down with their own mental health because they're not getting fulfilled themselves in doing the things they want to do to feel like they're living a fulfilled life as well, right? Mm -hmm. Getting to do the fun things they want to do and things like that. Um, what are some things you do in that scenario? Like, do you work things out with your significant other? And then what kind of like things do you do to burn off steam and go do those things that you enjoy? Like you love hunting and fishing yeah. and run a trap line and yeah, yeah. you like hiking and being in the mountains and things like that. Like, And now it's transitioned to a point where my kids, my oldest is old enough to where I can start taking them with. And, you know, my youngest is three cool. turning four soon and I can start taking them on the boat and it relieves that burden off of mom because she's been with them all day. I can go out there. Do we ever get any fish? No. Yeah. <laughs> but because two minutes into it, they're dipping the poles in the water and they're bored with it. Right. But it's still having fun for me True. out there and trying to get them in the outdoors and stuff. I enjoy that. It's just bringing them in to your hobbies. If you can do that, if you can accomplish that, if you've got that that gem of a person who loves everything that you love, life goes easier because on your breaks and stuff, you're all doing the same thing. You want to do the same thing. Um, so just getting them involved with whatever you are. Don't. I I was guilty of it a lot. You know, I'd get home and I'd I'd go down to my shop and I'd work and my shop's you know 100 yards away from the house, and I'd. The kids be in bed and I would just be down in my shop tinkering on whatever, doing whatever. And it's like you're not spending time with your wife at that point. You're just getting away and you're just doing what you want to do. So you got to be able to bring them in or go help them out. And it's not all about you. You got to make the family right first. And it's family first. If In my house anyways, it's family first, right? So I have to be willing to bring them with me or bend to that and, and go to where they want to go. They don't want to go on the boat they want to go to the ice cream store or whatever okay let's go get ice cream it's not what i want to do but i'm going to go with you okay and it's it's tough with the family it's a it's a new avenue in my life you know i've been a father for six years now and it's you learn something new every day and it keeps happening right but it gets better when they get older they get a little funner and you can start bringing them places and and it it really turns into something cool that you really do want to be a part of that more than you do want to work sometimes. It just, it's a, 
it's a way of transitioning into a different part of adulthood and uh it's fun and just enjoy it with your kids i know it's tough especially if you're on the road and you haven't seen them and the first thing you want to do is come home and just sit and relax and nobody talk to me for an hour but those kids don't see it that way those kids see it as dad's been gone for four weeks here he is i'm gonna jump on him and tear him apart and tell him everything he's missed in the last four weeks and it's like ah it's the last thing you want but you know it's the right thing to do so you do it and it's tough because like you said your mental health is just oh, it gets torn apart there because you only want to do relax that's it but you got to be willing to sacrifice a little bit for them and just man up more or less yeah and take time you, you work three weeks on you get a week off take time during those three weeks that you're working to to blow off some steam and and fo and focus on yourself because like if you're i guess i'm talking more of like fly and fly jobs and everything but you've got that time available to you do the things that you need to do to have yourself feeling good and taking care of yourself and then when you're at home it's like all it's all a balancing act right again i don't have kids so it's a little bit different for me but if i if i'm home for a week and i want to go climb some mountains or something and I'd only do that for the week, that's gonna send a message to my wife. Just like if I come home for the week and she's like, I'm gonna use this as an opportunity to take off for the week with some friends, it's gonna send a particular message. But if I come home and I make the first five days or four days about us, and then I take a morning or a day or two days or whatever, whatever it needs to be to do my thing, she's pretty understanding of that. And it's just, yeah, it's just a balancing act of talking with your spouse or your family before you make these decisions too. If you come home and you're like, here's what I'm doing and here's how it's going to go. It sends a different message than if you come home and you're like, here's what I would like to do on my time off. When does that fit into the schedule? What, what works for you? What works for me? That kind of thing. Uh, yeah. Just compromise and being flexible, just like other avenues of your life. Uh, you're building a or you're working on a relationship with somebody. So it's, it's give and take. take I think it's sides. important that you do make sure you spend time doing the things you want to do and mm. like to do as well. Um, it, it is a balancing act and yeah, this is like part of like managing a family and being a father and husband, whatever. Um, but it's important that you do the things you want to do. I, I believe that you can't, you can't keep sacrificing on those things mm -hmm. because just like everything else, just like jumping off trucks too much and climbing poles too hard, coming up and down too hard. It's going to, it's going to wear on your health. It's going to wear on your mental health and you're not going to find yourself in a good situation. So I, I think it's important. But you might have to adjust what those things are. Yes. You know, like maybe you find, um, you know, maybe you find half an hour listening to a podcast or an audio book as your new way of like, hey, this is something I enjoy doing. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Maybe it just changes into something a little different. It's going for a walk with your dog versus going for a hike in the mountains. But you take that and you like really enjoy that time and spend that time thinking and, you know, being present with yourself. It's important. Yep. Definitely. Yeah. And you, you got to have your priorities too. If, if, uh, for me going out in the mountains is that big of a priority to me as well as my, uh, my, my wife or my family or whatever, right? I got to make a decision at some point. Am I going to sacrifice Watch. my family time to go do this mountaineering or, uh, outdoor, whatever, whatever my hobby might be, or am I going to take some time off work and use that to do these things? Good that, that's when you got to make a decision too. And do, when we're talking about mental health, one thing I'll say that I see all time in the trade don't let this be your only identity. Like, do not make being a lineman the only thing sure. about your personality. Because at some point, you're going to make a mistake in the trade or whatever. Like we were talking about, everybody makes mistakes. And all of a sudden, your ego is going to be shattered. Because the only thing you have is that you're a lineman. And now, all of a sudden, you've made a mistake. And you're only a lineman. But now, all of a sudden, you're a bad lineman in your mind or whatever. Or at some point, the job's going to end. Things slow down, whatever. And you get laid off. Or you get sent to a new company or whatever. And then again, like all that shatters on you or it changes your outlook on who you are and everything. If you have a whole bunch of other stuff that give you confidence or give you some personality, when things don't go your way at work or when things don't go to plan, it's not going to matter as much. It's it's line works is too much of an involved career for it to just be a job, but it can't be everything about you either. Yeah. There's nothing worse than going out with a guy at night and you're trying to have a conversation with him, and all he can talk about is work. And you're like, <laughs> what do you do for fun? And he's like, take overtime I talk, calls I talk calls. about work yeah <laughs> like i don't know like they have no they're just very one dimensional and sure. i don't think that's good for your mental health it, no. it's great to love your job and to let it be a part of you in that yeah. sense but if that's all you got you're missing it on a lot of other stuff that you have in your life i'm a bit of an explorer in life and i like to try new things and i think that's like part of my life mission and goal just like my personality is like 
I've always easily been able to drop something and just go pick something else up and do it. And I talk about this quite a bit, how I don't think as adults, we do things like that enough. Like when you're a child, you'll pick up a skateboard one week, uh, three weeks later, you, you tried skateboarding and now I'm going to go play baseball or I'm going to like go bounce on whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to pick things up, drop them and move on. And maybe I never touch it again. Maybe I go back to it later in life, but you try new things. I don't think we do that as adults enough. What's your guys' take on that related to like career, job, trade, and how willing are you guys to like, you know, try this for a little while, yeah. drop it, go try something else? Oh yeah, I'm very willing to do that kind of stuff. I can put things on a shelf. Uh, before we started, I was talking about, I, I used to make tables like this all the time as a hobby. You know, a buddy of mine got our hands on a sawmill. <laughs> We'd drop trees, mill them up, and I'd make bar tops and tables and stuff for people all the time. I had a nice shop at my home in Ontario. When I moved out to Vancouver, it's crazy expensive real estate. There's no way I was buying a place with a hobby shop in it. Like, I, you didn't need to make an income out of it to make it worthwhile. Uh, so I just put all that stuff on the shelf. I gave a bunch of my tools to one of my buddies to keep an eye on while I'm gone. Uh, a bunch of the wood stored because it'll be fine when I get back. And I kind of realized, like, maybe this would be more of something that's fun to do when I'm, like, 40 or 50 or even as a, uh, at retirement age. So just put it on the shelf for now, and you can always circle back. You built the the skills to do it and the understanding on how to do it, you can always utilize that again later. And I treat line work the same way. Like right now we're both uh, instructing, right? So we're not using our hands on skills every day and we're not yeah. progressing in that sense and, and doing line work. But I'm confident that if my situation changed, I wanted to go jump on a crew. I think the only things that I'm probably going to lose a step in is like maybe some efficiency things. Maybe I'm building a bank and I miss, miss uh, count how many connectors I need to bring out with me. And I got to, boom down and get a connector or something small like that. But as far as actually doing line work, like safety stuff, procedural stuff, that's all, it's, it's all ingrained there. in you at this point yeah. to steep into the trade. It's yeah. You know how to do the work. It's just the efficiencies. But just willing to say yes to opportunities. I mean, as an apprentice, you're, you're just trained always say yes. Next job's coming. Yes. I'll take it. Yes. I'll take it. But that kind of the guys who are good and who, keep progressing as linemen and stuff like that those are the same guys who are like i've never done that job yeah i'll go try that i'll go work with helicopters i'll try bear handing we we did the bear hand program and stuff like that here it's, it was an opportunity that they said do you want to do it yeah i want to do it it's something i've never done before let's see if i like it go throw me on a job whatever it is right i've i've kind of always had that attitude to say yes to these opportunities when they come up even if i have no idea what they are because I kind of always embrace change. Like some people, change is bad. Yeah. No, can't change my little world. Like I can't leave this place. This is the only place I know how to do line work. It's like, I love that. I love leaving that behind and going, I've never seen how they do it here in Texas. Let me go see how they do it in Texas. I may hate it. I might like it. Mostly, I, I usually like embracing that change, though. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just think it's fun. It keeps you engaged, right? It's such uh, flawed thinking to not be able to embrace the change in this trade either. Cause if you ask any lineman who's been doing this for 30 years, how much has it changed since you started in night and day, right? Everything's changed. Even myself, how much has it changed in the last like 11 years, 12 years? It's changed quite a bit. Yeah. Um, all over the country, things are changing. So it's like, if, if you're not able to embrace that change, it's going to change with or without you. You either become an outdated crusty old lineman or you stay on the top of your game all the way to the end of the, the race. So yeah, I think that's important. And then to your, uh, point about saying yes to everything it's easy to say yes go bear handing go do this go do that say yes to everything though because maybe it doesn't sound maybe it doesn't have the sex appeal attachment to it maybe it's the same thing you've done in this city now you're just going to another city but when you're the guy who says yes to a bunch of that stuff too when you actually need to say no to something they're going to listen whereas if you're the guy who says no to everything you're just saying no again because that's what you do or when an opportunity comes up and they need to send four guys to go do this awesome job and everybody in the show up wants to go or everybody in the company wants to go and you're the guy who said yes to everything, you go, I would like to go on that. They're more likely, if you've built a good relationship with your employer, they're more likely to go, hey, you always do us a solid, we'll do you a solid on this one as well. Mm -hmm. So it, you shouldn't be doing anything for the immediate results, right? You should be doing things for yourself and, and for your progression to build and your down career. the road. Yeah, down the road, it always, it, it has for me, it's always worked in the wash and it's, it's always worked in my benefit. It, uh, it goes to building, building your whole life. It's building the whole story. It's, sure. you know, looking at, looking after your finances right from the start so that when an opportunity may or may not present itself or may, 
maybe you want a change even in career like maybe you want completely out of line work and you want to just try something else if you want to be a cop you want to whatever like mm -hmm. you can take that road road and go try something different and allow yourself that freedom to do that because you didn't blow all your money on cars and trucks and boats mm -hmm. and houses and things like that what would you blow it on <laughs> <laughs> whatever but you allowed yourself that opportunity to change up here change up your routine change up your life change up your destination change your career whatever yeah. and that's cool that's okay yeah. yeah 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 complacency is a weird thing in our trade man it's one of those things where it's kind of a weird thing everywhere it just but with us it's just so much more serious like it comes you get from the boomers right <laughs> Aren't you a boomer? <laughs> no. <laughs> first year of the millennials. Oh, there you go. Or yeah. first year, whatever you want to say. Didn't embrace it. Yeah. Um, it's just a weird thing. And, and like me and Matt talked about, we're on the same page with this. Like you get complacent with it. We get bored with it. We look for that change because mm -hmm. I need something to keep me engaged. And that's, you know, we're goal oriented people. Give me something to work for. If you're telling me there's a light at the end of this tunnel, tell me what it is and let me work towards it. If not, you get bored because you think, man, there's no progression here. Oh, I'm just stuck in this one utility for the rest of my life. And the best I'm going to do is be a lineman. Like, where's the goals in that? There's nothing besides grind it out and try not to kill yourself, right? And make it to retirement. <laughs> That's boring to me. Uh, I want a challenge. I want to sure. get out there. I want to see new things. I want to experience everything that line work has to offer so you can be the most well-rounded person. I, I think there's a really good quality in that. I think those are some of the coolest guys who tramp around and go see it just because they want to go see it. That's cool. I think that's awesome. And that's like one of the best parts of our trade. Heck yeah. Yeah. One of the things you said it's important to is work for it. Like that was one of the words you use. Nobody gets anywhere by doing the easy stuff, right? Yeah. You got, you got to be willing to say yes to the hard jobs and do the things it takes to build the skills. Cause otherwise you just stay stagnant and you get nowhere. That's it. And so, that goes for your personal life and for your uh, career life, I think, too. Do like take chances, do the hard things, push yourself, see what your limits are, yeah. kind of stuff. Absolutely. Um, before I get into a couple closing questions, fun ones. Uh, do you guys want to say anything else? You want to talk about anything else? You have anything else we heard talk about? No, really, no. I kind of covered a lot of stuff. Well, talking about there. last night. Let's not get into that. <laughs> Jk, Jk. All right. Uh, this question will be for each of you. You can answer individually. Uh, if you could live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Texas. <laughs> oh, good answer. Yeah. Anywhere with mountains for me. Yeah. I, like I enjoy where I'm at right now, but anyway, as long as there's a mountain range nearby, I'm pretty happy. You got somewhere you want to go in particular? I, I'm pretty new to BC, so I'm pretty satisfied there. Yeah. I would love to go check out Nepal. Um, I've gone to the Andes a little bit and climbed down there. I'd love to get back into the Andes. I don't know if I want to live there. It'd be a little bit tough to live there, but I'd love to go check it out again. But I'm, I'm really happy in BC right now. So probably just exploring more of BC. I'd love to go live in Squamish maybe or a little further North. Sweet. Yeah. Uh, if you could have coffee with one historical figure, who would you choose? You go. Oh, uh, I don't know. Maybe some like, Old old time explorer from Canada, the guys that were you know marching across Canada when there was no there was no side to that map. I think that's pretty fascinating. Alexander Mackenzie's one that's super impressive. He managed to do it without really making any enemies. He crossed northern Canada looking for the Northwest Passage, and at that point, Canada was pretty much only settled to Western uh, Ontario, maybe Manitoba. So came across a book. I think he learned like seven different indigenous languages as he's traveling and everything. So he's obviously very open-minded and I just, yeah, I think that's pretty impressive. You, that look, always like blows me away. The, the guys that like, there was nothing, they, they had no idea if like, is there an ocean 10 feet yeah. from now? Or yeah. is there like, <laughs> what's here? The unknown, and they just right? go and like, I ran into a mountain and another one and then an ocean. And it's like, and there's oh, an animal yeah. I've never seen before that tried to kill me. Yeah. yeah. So, sometimes I'm a little envious that we're born at a point in time where you know, it's like, there's not that yeah. much that's never been explored before. It'd be pretty cool to just, you don't know what's over the next hill and so you're the one that's going to find out and so that'd be that. you that'd be that yeah i think that'd be awesome that'd be yeah a, that, that pioneer yeah. just gets in the boat cool. and crosses the ocean yeah, and get your canoe and off you go <laughs> he's that guy <laughs> me i'm like uh I'm, I'm sitting here scratching my brain on 
uh, you know, the typical ones come to mind, which would just sound corny to Tesla. me. It's like Henry, no, Henry Miller, Tesla, right? Yeah, but that's in there. Somebody involved in a conspiracy. You're like, what really happened? There is one yeah. I would like to go, like, oh, let's talk to Bobby. We, we let's talk to Oswald. Robert. What really happened? We were just yeah. watching that last night when we went down yeah. that rabbit hole. Yeah. It's like, yeah, that would be a good one to talk yeah. to. But, uh, like, Neil Armstrong, uh, did you really go to the moon? Yeah, let's <laughs> yeah. talk about that. Let's His name is him. Alien backwards, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, no, like Daniel Boone or something like that. Like, uh, Teddy Roosevelt comes to mind just because all the stuff he's done for hunting. And I think that might be a cool conversation. Yeah. And, you know, there's a couple like that. I don't know. Couldn't pick one specifically. If you weren't a lineman, what would you be? Ooh, dead in a gutter somewhere, I'm sure. <laughs> no, uh, if I was in alignment, uh, when I originally went to uh, community college, I was studying uh, law enforcement. I wanted to be a cop because I see my dad be a see private investigator. And then uh, I, I realized quickly I could not become a cop. So I'm not going to yeah. be a cop. Why? <laughs> criminal record. No, <laughs> no. The criminal record's clean. Can't be a hypocrite. <laughs> can't, you can't be a hypocrite. Yeah. I speed all the time. Why would I pull someone over? Uh, no, it was just one of those things where the college way wasn't for me and meh. Didn't want it. Too much structure there. Mm -hmm. Need more freedom. I'm not sure what I'd be doing. Yeah, it's. Well, we already know you're a pioneer. Yeah, I'd be. A, I'd probably be a, just outside somewhere. You'd for be sure. a hermit somewhere. Yeah, in the mountains. yeah, just a homesteader somewhere. <laughs> a guide or a something. A guide. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. Oh, that would be a killer. Yeah, one, yeah, growing up in Ontario where I lived, it was just all farms everywhere. So that didn't even register as an option until way later in life. But that, that's definitely something I would have been interested in as a young man for sure. I well, obviously you guys know, but like just got back from Nepal hiking to mm -hmm. trekking to Mount Everest base camp and everything in that region is because of the elevation, everything in that region is packed in on a human's back on a yak or like, like it looks the size of a donkey. They call it a horse, but like it's the size <laughs> of a, it's the size of a donkey <clears throat> and it's amazing. These guides and these people that just like so these porters will pack 200 pounds plus on their back, but they don't have like backpacks or anything. This isn't on their shoulders. They make these like burlap sack straps their neck. and then they just tie like nylon rope to these straps and they tie it around the bags. They got this method of knots and system of tying these bags together and they pack everything propane bottles, gas bottles, like bags, food, chicken, eggs boxes of apples like everything in and out of these mountains is packed on their back and it is like it's amazing what these porters can do like porters guides yeah the guides that were guiding us as well like here we are just like you know taking seven days to get to it's supposed to be nine we're taking seven days to get to base camp da, da, da. we heard that our guides so our guides lived where we started you know, seven days ago, that's where their home was. They made it from base camp back home in one day. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> like, uh, just put you to shame, yeah. man. We're just like, what? Yeah. Like, how? Like, what are you talking about? Like, they were just jogging the whole time. No big deal. You it's a, insane. It's insane what they can do. Yeah. You got a friend who's a mountain guide, and he's fifty. Uh, he's been. He grew up in uh, Slovenia, and he's been in the Alps all his life lived in Patagonia and now he lives in Squamish and same thing. We'll get out there, me and another one of our buddies, we run all the time. We're fairly fit guys. We get on a mountain and that guy, he's not even out of breath and we can't keep up with him. He just disappears and then he waits where the trail forks and then he disappears and he waits. And it's, it's incredible what a year or a lifetime in the mountains can do. Yeah. But the whole Porter thing, I, I I'll offer him. I'm like, man, if you're going on anything cool, I'll do it for free. Like just bring me with you. Just to get out there more, I'll carry whatever stuff you need. Yeah, You'll just slow him down. Yeah, no, that's it. Yeah, hundred percent, I will. Oh, yeah, but they were like make his life easier. Whooping us, yeah. two hundred pounds on their back. <laughs> or just like, like and they're small. Day packs. Like, oh, they're small so, too. So small. <laughs> so small. There was a great story. Um, it was in a book called uh, Iger Dreams, and Iger Dreams has a, a compilation of mountaineering stories. And there's a story about this man. I believe he was German, but anyway, somewhere around there. Um, Reinhold Messner was his name. Yeah. And he's a legend. He, yeah, he's a legend. For anyone that doesn't know there, like, uh, pioneered the Alpen Ascent, mm -hmm. they called it. Yeah. So everybody, like, here's an example of Everest. So to go to Everest, for the typical people who climb Mount Everest, it takes a month plus 
to climb Everest because you get to base camp, you acclimatize, you yeah. go to camp one, you hang out for a bit, you come back to base camp and you do this series of like gradually working your way up the mountain. Then you do a summit push. Huh. Reinhold Messner, the Alpine ascent is like, okay, I got to base camp one day, knocks the summit off and down. Like just not even some water with them. Like yeah, just no gonna, fixed ropes. Just nothing. here you go. Yeah. There you go. I'm gonna crush this hill. Yep. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's right there. In the Just world. go. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna crush this hill. I'm gonna move on to the next one. Yeah. Amazing, amazing human. He's gone through all the mountains on planet Earth, basically. Mm, Just much. crushing it. Ugh. Crushing. Yeah. And he and he did it in times where they're using like yeah hard leather boots and ro- like static ropes and yeah the heavy hemp ropes, all that kind of yeah, stuff. Yeah, this is like 60s, 70s, 80s. Yeah, Just there. Built incredible. Different, yeah, man. incredible. Yeah. yeah, super cool. And managed to survive. Mm-hmm. Okay, one more. Uh, most valuable tool in the lineman's kit? Go wrench. Okay. 100%. <laughs> I've got that one. Love yeah. my go wrench, yeah. Oh, dude, it's a Milwaukee hammer wrench, man. Those things are slick. Hammer, I'm not sure of those. Have you seen the Milwaukee low wrenches that they got? Yeah. They got the hammer head on Oh, yeah, 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 those are nice. I took the place. Not sponsored. Not sponsored? <laughs> uh, Klein, then? I don't know. Everything is a hammer, though. You just got to be brave yeah. with yeah, it. Yeah, you really do. <laughs> those things are nice. Uh, no, I know you're looking for, you know, something something else but like just being open-minded too about it as well like we talked about i like that hearing other people's ideas 90 percent. a lot of this job as an apprentice is reading people that's that's why linemen like to gamble so much and play poker right it's because we're practicing reading people and reading the room sure that's what it is as an apprentice yeah (laughs) as an apprentice you got to be able to read the room and see where you fit in so that kind of goes back to being open-minded and and open ears on that yeah being adaptable i'd agree yeah, you got to be able to change, roll with the punches as they come. The work proceed, or uh, the way we do the work might change over the years. So you got to be able to adapt to that. When you go from utility to utility, if you're a contractor and you're working for all these different utilities, they have different rules that you got to play by. Like regionally, it happens. Uh, if you got to be expected to switch from rubber gloves to sticks, you just got to be adaptable to whatever comes your way. And then you're going to work for different foremen. You're going to have different journeymen, different apprentices work under you. So with that comes. You're going to need to be adaptable to work with those guys and their experiences and their skill sets. Um, like when you're working as a journeyman with another foreman, you got to be able to adapt to how he wants to do things because it's his call. And then when you're a foreman, you got journeyman and apprentices working for you. Maybe I used to have RJ working for me and he's really good at this and not good at that. So I have to adapt my game plan to fit that. And then my next journeyman, maybe it's the complete opposite. So now I got to adapt my game plan to suit the guy that I'm working with. Lots of adaptation with RJ. <laughs> he can Everybody do anything. Asked him. He can do anything. Yeah. Just ask him. Yeah. All right, guys. Well, I appreciate your time. Thanks for making the trip out. It's really good to see yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks for having us. It was fun, man. All right, guys. I hope you enjoyed that episode. Um, if I could ask you to do one thing for me, one favor. If you enjoy these episodes and you love them and you're not yet subscribed, could you please go to whatever podcasting platform you listen to these on, whether you're listening or on YouTube? Make sure you're subscribed and following, whatever that is. It helps us out huge and it helps us grow. So really appreciate that. If you can do that for us, love it. See you in the next one.